<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Hope you are well. No doubt you're watching this on playback at the moment. So I've got a nice big mug of coffee. Um, if you're new here, this is the Catch Fishing Channel. Um, it's very wintry out there. I've been out there filming today. November is an incredibly busy month for this channel. I've got loads, um, much more time this month to spend uh, uploading videos for you, uh, not only to this channel, but to the uh, Match Fishing channel as well, which is the membership channel that runs alongside this channel. That really is the one that keeps this channel going, to be fair. So I've got loads of time on the bank um, filming those. So um, I've been on, well, I haven't been on the bank today. I've been in here filming today. Uh, I filmed two videos today. I'm back out there tomorrow and I'm back out there possibly Tuesday and Wednesday on the bank getting through this very, very long list of videos that I've got to put together, mainly for YouTube. All right. So um, if that's the kind of thing you're into, then, you know, hit subscribe and you'll not miss out on them. It's been a, it's going to be a very, very busy month, November. And um, I'm going to try and keep my commitment or I will keep my commitment to doing at least one live stream for YouTube. Um, the only reason why I don't do more live streams here on YouTube, obviously I, I still do quite a few over on the membership channel on the match fishing channel. But the reason why I don't do so many on here is sometimes because we just get so many people logging on. I'm obviously here on my own, as you can see, and it's a little bit difficult going through the chat and being able to respond to everybody. And I have had a few complaints from people who I just haven't had a chance to uh, uh, respond to their message just purely because there were so many. Um, and I obviously don't want to go upsetting anybody. So, you know, that's the main reason why I don't do more on YouTube. So um, I just want to check in with a few people. Hopefully you can hear me OK. Nobody's mentioned anything. Andre's here. Good evening. Thanks, Andre. Back to the 90s. Good evening, everybody. Everybody's here. That's great. From uh, Belgium, France, um, England. Brilliant. I know there's quite a few of you. Um, basically, this was an unannounced live stream. The reason for that, it wasn't any sort of... Uh, tactical move what basically happened is that my plans for this evening have changed and i've got more work done today than i expected and so i thought i'd take the opportunity as we are still in the first week of november just to have a check-in with you now hopefully i can have another check-in with you later on in the month but we'll see how it goes i know it's um it's an evening when there's probably more more people out and about. Um, but unfortunately, this was the best time that I had to do it. So I'm going to have a keep having a swig of the old coffee to keep me going. All right. Great to see everyone logging on. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. You can hear me. All right. That's great. Like I say, this is unannounced. So there won't be as many people on tonight as normal. So hopefully I can at least um, keep in touch with all your chats. How is everybody? Let me know how you're getting on. Um if you don't post any questions in there about your fishing and stuff, then obviously I will be just letting you know what I've been up to through November. Uh, well, mainly through the back end of October, the first week of November and letting you know what I'm doing for the rest of the month. So it's been very, very busy. Um, wow, that coffee is really hot. And the main task for this week has really been to finish off the, um, the next course that I know a lot of people are waiting for. Um, if, if you aren't familiar with that, it's, it's our next online course. I think this is our fifth one. And basically this course, it's a 42 video course that is focuses on rod and line tactics. So that's method feeder, bomb, PVA fishing and waggler fishing um, through the winter months on commercials. All right. I know there are so many people out there. I get to see all the stats from this channel i know the average age of people that watch this channel and i know what kind of fishing they like and a lot of them don't like to get involved in pole fishing whether it be through the tattle side of it as we all know to try and compete on today's match circuit it's an absolute it's a mammoth task but if you start going pole fishing as well as all your rod and line fishing then the amount of gear that you end up carrying is just incredible i mean to carry at least two pole rollers all your top kits and all that sort of stuff all your stack of rigs a lot of people don't want to do that, you know, and I completely understand that. I, I can relate to that. So a lot of people want to be able to um, compete in matches, but on a rod and line. Um, and that's what that course is all about. So just to make sure everyone's kept in the loop, um, I'm going to put a link. There we go. I'm just going to put a link to that course for you. You can pre-order it and you get a discount if you pre-order. So just to let you know, because I'd hate you to find out afterwards that you could have had a discount. So there you go. So the main um, aim for this week is to be to finish that course off. Like I say, it's 42 videos, which is a lot of time. 
um, uh, and, and <laughs> an effort. Um, and it's filmed partially in, in the tackle room and partially out on the bank as well. So that's been the main task for um, the last few days. So before I go through the other stuff that I want to tell you about, I just want to see if there's anything in the chat because I don't want to ignore anybody who's taking the time and effort to log on tonight. Um, great to see so many messages. Thanks for everybody. Thank you for everyone who's been watching the videos. I know you've enjoyed some of them recently. I've done one or two videos recently that have kind of been behind the scenes, certainly the international stuff from the World Championships in France and from the World Club Final in Bulgaria. Thank you for all the great messages about those. Um, the last video that I did was a couple of days ago. Uh, no, it wasn't. Yeah, it was a couple of days ago, and it was um, fishing with lean and soil. Uh, and now we can use that in winter, either mixing it with ground bait or using it on its own. It can be a great winter technique or a winter tactic. So um, if anyone's interested in that, the video has been on this channel on YouTube for the last couple of days. So I know quite a few people have enjoyed watching that because it's something different. Um, I've had a few people asking me about the channel recently. And basically what they've been asking me is, um, do I kind of chase views um, and, and things like that? And in all fairness, no, I don't chase views. If I was to chase views, all my videos would be virtually the same. Any video that gets any sort of traction and gets plenty of views mainly revolves around a commercial venue and it revolves around carp. Now, I've got to be absolutely honest with you that if I was if I was chasing views and wanted every video to be really, really successful, then that's all I'd do. I, I really would. But I think most of you have known me for quite a while now. And it, this channel's not about that. It's about sharing my experiences, whether I'm on a reservoir, where there aren't any fish in front of me or whether I'm on a venue where I'm going to catch 200 pound of, of carp uh, three feet away from my net. It, it's just, I want to share everything with you and I like to keep that variety. Um, and, and I know that there's some videos that I produce, certainly going to venues that I go to that, you know, I know I'm not going to catch much. I, I just, because there aren't many fish there or they're not fishing, it's not fishing very well. And um, I still want to share that experience with you. And that's what this channel is about. So, there's lots of variety coming through winter, through November, December, January, and February. I'm going to be out there on some faster flowing rivers, um, some canals, some big reservoirs as well. And there are a few surprises thrown, getting thrown in there as well. So I think you know that you know most of this channel has revolved around feeder fishing, but there's a hell of a lot of variety there as well. And hopefully that's what you're enjoying. I, I really do because... I, if I wanted to do, if I needed every video to be about carp fishing and chasing view, I'd get fed up with making videos. I wouldn't want to do them because I, you know me, I like variety. So um, that answers that question. I think that a few people have asked. So uh, thanks for letting me know you can hear me. Okay, hope you are all well. Um, if you keep hearing the odd firework and crash and bang in the background, that is because it is the sixth of November, and as we all know in England, the um, Bonfire night isn't a one-night affair. It's usually a two, three, or four-night affair. So, yes, bonfire night was yesterday, but obviously it's, it's rolling over into tonight as well. So apologies if you keep hearing anything like that. Um, Ian, hi, Jamie. Glad you did this much better than watching Strictly Rubbish with the wife. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. That's good. That is good, Ian. Thanks for that. Uh, Regal Homes Limited. Hi from the Bahamas. All oh, right. Okay, then. Right. I've got a question for you, Regal Homes, and a few, a few other people will have. Why are you in the Bahamas watching um, a video or, or a live stream about match fishing in the UK? Are you are you a match angler from here that's over there on holiday or something? Or what? Let, let me know, because I would imagine that the kind of fishing over there is completely different from how it is here. So And the weather, no doubt. Um, Chris Buckley is here. Good evening, Chris. Hope you're well, mate. Hi, mate. Been a blustery day today at Springvale. Caught well on the bomb again. Chris, um, that was a big bang. Um, Chris, I think one of my one of our mates has been at Springvale today. Chris, um, Luke, I think you know Luke. Luke Naylor, I'm sure you do. He is a patron, and remember, I'm sure he's been at Springvale today. Have you fished the same match? Let me know. Keith Harrison's here. Hope you're well, Keith. Um, good evening, Jamie. Hope all is well. Yes, everything's fine. Thank you. I'm very very busy. Um, but what you're going to be seeing is that over the next few weeks, is you're going to be see see quite a bit more consistency and the number of uploads. Simple as that. Just purely because all the major competitions, the World Championships, the World Pairs never took place, and the World Club Final are all behind us now. Um, we are unable to fish the Holcroft Winter Pairs, so I can't fish that. And another bit of news that I found out today that um, I, I think most of you will be happy about. Yeah, I'm sure you'll be happy about. And that is that I can't fish the Golden Rod Feeder Final. 
All right. Now, I haven't qualified for it. I haven't fished any qualifiers for it. But I know a lot of people know I like to fish that competition through the winter where we fish the series of qualifiers on different venues. And the final takes place in March, two day final at Larford Lakes. All right. It's a big money final. And, and I think most of you know that I like to go in those qualifiers and hopefully I keep trying to get in that final like I have been in the past. However, I found myself with um, about 10 golden rod feeder tickets that I went out of my way when they went on sale to buy all in one go, spent a fortune. Um, and now I found out that I can't fish the final because it clashes with the Iberian Masters. So um, so I could actually go in the qualifiers and fish them as a match, but to be honest, I'm not that bothered. Um, I just want to fish them as a qualifier to try and get in the final, but I can't fish the final. But I think you'll be pleased to hear that because that means that I will be at the Iberian Masters next year and I will be filming it for you with an even bigger and an even better film of it for you. And I think a lot of you know that I've got kind of unfinished business in that event. It's an event that keeps kicking me up the backside um, and uh, I need to get back there to get back on the horse. I, I desperately want to win that event. I've come very close on at least two occasions. So, yes. So if anybody sees on Facebook or, or Instagram, I am on Instagram now. Finally, people have been asking me Instagram. It's Jamie Harrison Anglin. Simple as that. That is what it is. So it's at Jamie Harrison Anglin. Please give us a follow. I'll give you a follow back as soon as I assuming I know who you are. Um. And that is somewhere where I can constantly upload daily kind of photographs and let you know what we're doing on the bank. Um, and while I'm on the subject of that, I just want to hit this nice and early while we've got a nice figure of uh, a nice number of people on the channel is that I'm also going to be exploring the short stories theme or the short stories facility right here on YouTube so that I can upload um, uh, videos that are up to 60 seconds long more frequently. Um, in between the actual regular uploads because I want to obviously share a lot of the experiences that I'm now more fortunate to get involved in because I'm out on the bank a lot more, whether it will be coaching or whether I'm just doing some filming or something like that. So, um, so yeah, hopefully you're going to enjoy those. So, yeah, the good news, well, the bad news from that is you won't be seeing me trying to progress through to the Golden Rod Feeder final this year. But the good news is that's because I will be at the Iberian Masters. So there we go. But that's going to be the first... Uh, it's the first few days in March, so obviously that's a while away yet. Um, right, okay then, let's have a quick check in who's here, because I love the fact that you all go out of your way to come and say hello. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, this, I mean, this stream is open to everybody, all right? Obviously, big thank you to subscribers and members. There are one or two members on here as well, which is great. Um, so, yes, thank you. It's great to see you all checking in from all different countries. Uh, I've got a question here from Gary Adams. Hi, Gary. Quick question. At what distance do you start to use braid for roach? It's a great question that, um, Gary, basically, um, long term viewers to this channel will know that I've always kind of advocated using braid after a certain range. All right. So if you're fishing the feeder, say you're fishing up to, say, 20 meters or 25 meters, then I will always use mono. And that's because braid is a little bit too direct for fishing at such short range. And you run the chance of, of, of bumping fish or pulling the hook out and all that sort of stuff. I, my fishing over the last 12 months have taken a, a massive turn in my fishing. And I, I know for a fact that has re, been reflected in the big matches that I've fished this year. All right. Now, basically for roach, I will now fish for roach with braid at any range all right so i don't have a minimum range you know i don't say if i'm fishing less than say 15 meters then i'll use mono i don't do it i always use braid and i, I do that for a couple of reasons gary all right the first reason is i'm very comfortable at doing it now all right and that might sound like a really daft thing to say but i'm very in in touch with braid at the moment at such short range a lot of that came from the two festival well the festival and the feeder masters final because we were fishing on some cases on one of the days i was fishing at six meters with braid okay and i just got used to it the other reason why i can seem to make it work now is because i'm using soft rods i'm using the um the um commercial uh, slim the slim rod, 3.3 meter, it's a very soft rod. And that means that you're not bumping fish off, okay? The other reason, Gary, is that I always use a shot leader with it as well. So I wouldn't fish braid direct, but I will build a short shot leader into it. Now, some people prefer the power gun rig, and I totally get that. I completely understand. And I love the fact that certainly some of you viewers, I know for a fact that have gone out and tried the power gun rig, and you're very comfortable with it and you use it all the time. You use it for roach and bream and that's fantastic. 
However, it's just not for me. It's just not for me. I, I don't want anything within my rig that's going to overcomplicate things. When I can fish with a normal free-running rig, no feeder link or anything like that, no spin-off booms, I can do that, but I can use a short shock leader. So if I'm after roach, I will build a short shock leader into it, okay? And on some occasions, that's just a metre and a half. Simple as that. And that just gives it a tiny bit of cushion for when you're picking up on fast biting uh, fish at such short range. Just gives it a tiny bit of sponginess. But like I say, I'm using a soft rod as well. I will only do that with a slim. I won't do it with the with the commercial feeder or the commercial bomb or any of the other rods, just a slim. And that's because it's nice and soft and I find I don't lose fish. But just a word of warning, um, Gary, I don't know why you're asking that question. But it's possibly something that you fish. It's a technique that you do or you're going to get into. I just want to make a massive point at saying to you, Gary, that your hook choice will be make a big difference as well all right some hooks are just not right for it some aren't sharp enough some are too sharp and you need to get the size of the hook right as well okay um but yeah i hope that answers that for you gary and uh, yeah it's um i'm just it, it, like i say i just build a short shot leader into it so that you've got some sort of sponginess there so you're not you, the, the, you know the hook's not ripping out of the fish's mouth all the time um paul best what a great result on your second day in the feeder masters very well done thank you mate my feeder fishing has improved so much thanks to you if you get a chance try buscott park all right i don't know that one i'll have to have a look at that one thanks paul appreciate that mate you know i want to share as much as i possibly can on this channel with you and you know a lot of the things that i kind of pass on to you are things that i've either had to learn myself or it's just stuff that i've learned from my experiences or from are we still connected? I just had an error message come up then, so I hope we're still connected. Richard Webb. Hi, Jamie. When you fish... I'm hoping the stream's connecting all right. I'm getting one or two messages coming up, so let me know if uh, if you're struggling to see anybody. Richard Webb. Hi, Jamie. When you fish out in the water on a platform, you don't look like you wear any waders unless under your bib and brace. How do you keep your legs dry? I do. I've been getting asked that for about three or four years, since I first started do, doing the World Pairs videos from, from Ireland every September. I kept getting asked the same thing. It is I don't like wearing chest waders. I never have enjoyed wearing chest waders. Um, I just think they're completely unnecessary because certainly now, because all the venues we go on now and all the comp competitions we, we, we compete in, you've got a 50 centimetre wading rule. You cannot wade out past 50 centimetres. So to wear chest waders to me is just, it's just unnecessary and it's uncomfortable. Certainly sometimes in the summer when it's hot as well, they're not the most comfortable things to wear. So you can only wade up to your knee anyway. So I just don't see the point. I did have some chest waders once and I basically cut them down to the waist because I just didn't want all that bit here. So yes, in answer to your question, um, when I'm wading out, um, I don't wear it out. It's very rare I wear it out in wellies or boots because obviously they only go that high. But waders I wear, but I wear them underneath either my over trousers or my bib and brace. But yeah, I have been asked that before, Richard. Well spotted though. <laughs> uh, Mark Lee, evening, mate. Looking forward to Lindome. Good. Yeah, we have got two matches at Lindome for the members. The first one is is matched up, but the second one, there are still some places on, on the second one. I think it's the 12th of... December, I think it is. So if there are any members interested in that, then let me know. It is all paid for. I've paid all the pegging and everything. So it's just a nice social get together. It's really nice. We're all here interacting, which is nice, but it's nice to do it face to face and catch a few fish as well. So uh, that's just my bit of a thank you to everyone for, for being members. So yeah, on the second date, there are places available if anyone's interested. And if you are on the first one, you can come on the second one as well, if you wish. It's entirely up to you. Um, David Wilson, up your channel and yourself are doing well. Yes, doing very well, thank you. Just trying to get the, the work life balance right, you know, and thankfully it's starting to pay off now. So I'm getting a chance to do all those things that I wouldn't normally have chance because, you know, when you're living your life at 100 miles an hour, it's it's difficult sometimes. So, Andre, are you guys at Ringers Club focused on FIPS only, or do you have any plans to participate in some of the European method? feeding competitions in the future thanks um andre i can't there's a lot behind that and there's a lot i can't really say to be fair unfortunately i'm sorry but um at the moment no we don't have any plans to fish in in the um in the european method feeder competitions yet so we'll see what happens but at the moment no uh, at the moment we've got the obviously ringers ringer baits that's the um that we fish for the for the world club 
uh, qualifiers, and that's so we fished in the World Club um, final, as in Bulgaria. And then the only other focus for those lads, because four out of the five, there's obviously me, but the other four are in the England team, um, the England feeder team. So, and they fish the World Championships every year. So that is their main focus of the year. All right, not for myself. It is a focus, but not obviously. I'm not. Um, I'm not fishing. So, so no, not at the moment, Andre. But I will let you know if that changes, mate. Uh, Richard Godfrey, hi Jamie. 14 to 16 meter snake lakes over or underarm casting with an eight foot or 10 foot rod. Um, it's, well, it's whatever's comfortable for you, you know. Um, I mean, an eight foot rod you can overhead cast at that sort of range, it's nice. There are shorter rods, seven foot, eight foot, nine foot rods overhead. Um, however, I don't use rods that short, I only use one rod that's 10 foot, one only rod, and that rod is permanently set up with heavy line on it. Um, and that's for targeting the margins for big fish when you're going close to features. So that's set up with 10 pound line. And that is basically my margin fishing rod. That's the only use I really have for my 10 foot rod. OK, and that is a 10 foot commercial feeder. Fantastic rod. But that is the only rod I use it for. All my other sort of fishing, um, I, uh, Richard, I use an 11 foot rod, you know, or 3.3 meter for our European friends. Um and that's just because I'm comfortable with that sort of a rod. So that sort of range, 14 and 60 metre, because I use an 11 foot rod, I can just underarm it nicely. Uh, it's comfortable for me. So it's what whatever it takes for you to get there, Richard. So if you've got a really short rod, you can go overhead because that, you know, it's 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 the length of the rod that allows the, the trajectory of the feeder going up. But if you've got a longer rod, you can underarm it. It's whatever's comfortable for you. Uh, Scott, hi, Jamie. Loving the content lately. Just a quick question. What would you ever use the lean ground bait mix on the hybrid method feeder? Um, no, I wouldn't. No. Whenever we want to cut back really with uh, the hybrid or a method feeder or an open method feeder, we just tend to scale back the size of the feeder. I've never heard of anybody doing that. I'll be absolutely honest with you, Scott. There might be a way for it to work or it might have a purpose. I'm not really sure, but it's not something I've ever done. But if you try it, please, please let us know. Uh, Regal Holmes live here most of the time, but get back to UK occasionally to Thorn. That's a little bit of a change from the Bahamas to Thorn. Wahoo, seasoned here now, but looking forward to some course fishing in the UK. Thanks for sharing your knowledge. No problem, and thank you for getting back to us. It's always nice to know where people are and why they are uh, where they are, and um, that they still miss their fishing, especially around Thorn. There's loads of fishing around, around Thorn, hell of a lot of fishing around there. Um, Joe Humphreys, thanks, Jamie. You have helped me so much to improve my fishing. You are a true gentleman. No problem, Joe. It's just really nice. The bottom line to it all, thanks for all these great messages. But the bottom line is people keep watching. All right. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this live stream tonight is just to say a personal thank you to everybody. And that is because the my recent upload, which was two days ago, was uh, was my 400th YouTube video. You know, it's an incredible milestone, to be honest, you know, and I can. Yes, obviously, I've had to produce all those videos. However, I wouldn't have produced that many if people weren't watching. You know, I would have stopped after seven if people weren't watching or, you know, or I wasn't seeing the channel grow. So I just want to say a personal thank you to everybody, certainly, especially the people that have followed this channel right the way through from when it started in 2016. I think it was when it officially got going. So thank you to everybody um yeah 400 videos it's flown but i'll tell you what there's another 400 on the way but the next 400 will be better than the previous 400 i promise you so thank you for everybody following the channel that's the only reason why i've kept doing what i'm doing so no problem joe and thanks for thanks for you know letting me know mate nigel bennett evening jamie any quick and easy tips for this coming winter yes um i haven't been fishing today but my first tip to you for winter is wrap up warm I only got out of the van once today to take a couple of photographs at a reservoir and it was freezing. I was out of the van for about 90 seconds and I couldn't wait to get back in. Just get wrapped up nice and warm. That's definitely the key. Um, if you're a pleasure angler, just think about your location. You know, think about your location and think about bites. I know lots of people that lose interest through winter. And part of the reason for that is because they're going to venues where they just aren't fish feeding. You know, it's all right going to a favoured venue that might fish well in the summer, but some summer venues are terrible in winter, you know. So just think about your bites. You know, if you just want to be out there catching fish, then just change your approach slightly. You might want to fish with maggots 
worms or soft pellets or depending on the venue you're fishing just fish for bites you'll be amazed how many times you just fish for bites the time will fly you'll love every minute you'll be nice and busy you won't be thinking about the cold because you're catching fish and you'll be amazed how many good fish you can catch on those smaller baits in winter you know you can be far less selective in um in, in 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 winter just fish for bites and it's amazing how many good fish you can catch and the other surprising thing in winter is that even when you scale down in your hook size if you scale down in your line strength diameter and, and diameter if you scale down in bait as well when you do hook those biggest fish because the water is colder because they're not swimming about as much it's amazing how many times you can land a big fish on such light tackle especially in winter so, yeah, just fish for, it depends what sort of fishing you're doing, Nigel, but it, I, that's hopefully a nice sign that you're going to fish through winter. I think we are seeing more fish, um, more people fish through winter, which I think is great. You know, it's great for the sport, great for fisheries, um, and it's healthy as well. It's well, so as long as you're nice and warm. Uh, Frank, oh, thank you, Frank. Yeah, Instagram, don't forget if you want to keep in touch. P, I don't know who P is, but thank you, P. Have you got any more underwater filming coming up? Yes. I mean, the Matrix, if you're referring to the Matrix Submerge series, then that is continuing. For those people that don't know about that, that is basically a series of videos where we've done some professional underwater filming just to see what's happening underwater. What happens to your bait? We've done some with float fishing, pole fishing, feeder fishing. Um, we've just done one a few days ago that went live. These are all on the Matrix fishing channel. So if you go to YouTube, type in, in Matrix, it will come up with the videos there. Um, and they are just really, really nice insights. They stem into a video that I've just been doing. There we go. A nice big feeding feeder. I've just filmed Monday night's video for you. So there will be a video on YouTube at 7 p.m. And that is a clue to what it's all about. OK, so um, but yeah, the recent underwater filming is basically been looking at how these feeders empty underwater, how they actually empty, what the kind of spread is and all that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in that sort of thing, then they are uh, free to watch over on the Matrix YouTube channel. So, yes, there are more coming. There is one at there's definitely one on Christmas Day because that one's already been filmed. And there are three of us in that one. We've got, obviously got Rob Hughes, who was doing the underwater filming. Um, it was filmed by Craig Butterfield, Adam Firth, and the three anglers involved are myself, Jamie Hughes, and Mark Pollard. So, and that's a little bit, it's a Christmas edition. It's Christmas special for you, and I think that's going live on Christmas Day on the Matrix channel. So, yeah, there's definitely one more in the pipeline there, but I know there will be more getting filmed. It's just a case of coming up with original topics to cover because we want to keep them nice and fresh. So, yes. Uh, thanks for all the great messages, everybody. That's brilliant. I'm just going to see if there's any more questions here because I don't want to ignore everybody. Uh, Mark Lee, have you had a play with the one mil feed pellets yet? Um, no, I haven't. And that's because um, I'm not getting them until Monday. Um, <laughs> I actually, yeah, there was some, some stuff sent out to me a few days ago. Uh, I thought it might have come today, but it hasn't. So possibly Monday, Tuesday, and I'll let you know I'll get on with them, Mark. You know, I don't, I'm not quite sure where they will fit into my fishing yet, but they could be a nice addition for winter. So if anyone's not familiar with what they are, basically sauna baits have just brought out a one millimeter feed pellet, and that's what Mark's referring to. So, yes, I'll let you know I'll get on with those. You'll see me using them. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing them. Um, Taz Fishing, hi, Jamie. Love your YouTube con content. It really helped me with my match fishing this season. Thank you. Zach from Aldershot. No problem, Zach. Thanks for logging on and thanks for um, following the channel, mate. Um, Gary, cheers. Yes, I am okay with short distance. At a match tomorrow on a reservoir of 330 acres in Suffolk. Wow. I hope that's going to be all right, mate. Some of those large venues can be a little bit of a test, a bit grim during winter. So good luck, mate. Let us know how you get on. Uh, Royal Catch, hello from the Ukraine. We learn a lot from your lessons and videos. Thank you. Thanks for that. Please let me know if there are anybody watching from one of the countries that, um, you know, your styles of fishing and your interests might be different from ours here in the UK, then please let me know. All right. You know, I I don't chase views. You know that if I did, then every video would be on a commercial uh, catching carp. And I'm, I'm not like that. This I need the, this needs to be, a, you know, plenty of variety on this channel. So if anybody's watching from a country like the Ukraine, um, I know there's one or two from Belgium tonight and one or two other countries. Please let me know if there's certain styles of fishing that you'd be interested in seeing videos about, because I know there's lots of people here that are interested in lots of the European tactics and the way that people fish abroad. So, yes, please let me know because I don't want to produce videos 
that you don't want to watch. So if you can let me know what you want to see, then that suits me. That's brilliant. Uh, how is your dad, Jeremy? He's very well, thank you. He's very well. He's watching TV at the moment. Um, but yeah, he's very well, thank you. He's, he's, he's keeping well. Um, how mate? Hope you are, Terry. Are good. How is Dean, please? Hi, Mick. Good evening, mate. Um, I haven't spoke to Dean. I had a missed call from him yesterday. Um, and I rang him back and he didn't answer. So uh, I'm assuming he was busy. I think he may have been in a match today. I don't really know. But I spoke to him two days ago and he was much, much better. Thank you, Mick. Much, much better. He was still seeing out his little bit of quarantine um, or isolation. So I haven't heard from him. So I'm taking that as though that's good news. And he's, you know, back on his feet and he's getting on with his life. So, yes, thank you, Mick. As far as I know, he's, all, he's OK, mate. Um, right, Stephen, have you had a look with an inline maggot feeder, Jamie? Yes, I have, Stephen, mate. I've just been asked to put a video together about the maggot feeders. Uh, that's great timing, that. So I will be putting one together for the maggot feeders. And, I mean, it's a great time of year for maggot feeders, you know, because a lot of time the fish in winter, when the water's clearer, certainly if you're just fishing for bites, then the maggot feeder can be brilliant because, let's face it, maggots, fish will, all fish will eat maggots, won't they? You know, and, and they're much, much less intrusive and they're less selective as well. Some of the venues we fish now, you're fishing for a bite. You know, it might be nice to catch a four pound bream or a five pound carp. But if you can catch five or ten pound of roach, eyed, perch and whatever in between, then that's brilliant. And that's how you can do it with a maggot feeder. So, yes, I have caught some fish with them, Stephen. I'm going to be out filming. Um, I'm hoping it's going to be this week, but it depends how tight I am to get reach my Friday deadline for the course launch, which is on Friday. So, yeah, uh, if it looks like I'm not, you know, I'm struggling to hit that deadline, then I will be filming that the week after. But yeah, it will be doing some inline maggot feeder fishing. And you might not know about this. I'm amazed how many people don't know about this, but the inline maggot feeders that um, Matrix actually make, they're the ones that you will see me using and you might have seen me use already. There is actually a stem that can convert it from an inline feeder so that it's a more conventional style feeder. So if you want to fish with a, a maggot feeder that's like on a Paternoster rig, for example, or a free running maggot feeder, you know, the standard maggot feeder that we're all familiar with, then that is a stem that converts the feeder into that, which I think is really clever. And that's what I'm going to be showing in the video because, you know, you can catch even more fish. Uh, I mean, the inline maggot feeder is great, but usually we do that, use that with a four inch hook length. And it's a little bit more of a commercial type method. However, with that conversion where you can change the stem and fish with a conventional maggot feeder where you've got a decent hook length, it's much less selective. And it can be great for catching fish that are up in the water, you know, that like eyed chub as well. Certainly, you know, you can use them on rivers as well now, you know, that sort of a feed. So, yes, Stephen, I have, and I am putting a video together for you about that, mate. So I'll let you know when that's done. Um, great to see so many people logging on. Thank you. I wasn't sure if you'd all be out socializing this evening so it's great to see so many of you logging on um who else have we got here um jamie can't wait for the next meeting on 27th pal brilliant shane that's great looking forward to seeing you uh one more question about plovdiv okay did you notice that carasio takes later in the week where much better with mono or mono leader than direct braid or feeder gum can you explain why um that must have just been to do with the way that the rig works, I think. You know, when you've got power gum on your rig, there is something on the rig there for the fish to feel. You know, I haven't caught many Carasio, I'll be honest with you. Up until I went to Plovdiv in Bulgaria for that world final, I'd only caught a few Carasio, and I really caught them by accident, and that was at the Iberian Masters each year. I've always caught one or two, but I've never fished for them. At the Iberian Masters, I've only ever really fished for carp. And I've caught the odd Carasio while I've been there, but I've never targeted them specifically. But what I have learned about them is that they are very much like, um, I mean, I'm not sure where you are, but they're very much like what we're used to as F1 fishing. They're very shy biting fish. And they're also very similar to Crucian carp as well. You know, when I fished that, that winter, learning how to fish with soft pellets when I first got back into fishing in 2000, I think it was 2012 that year or 11. Um, I fished all winter with soft pellet with the pole for F1s and crucians. And that's where we were fishing dead depth. You were putting your last, your last start was literally two inch from the hook and you're almost feeling fish on, you know, you literally, you'd got your float dotted right down and you're almost just lifting and feeling fish onto the hook. And that's where I kind of learned about how delicate 
uh, a fish at feeding that they are and Carasio are, are very much the same. But I mean, we basically found that, you know, we didn't get as many, the bites weren't as good with braid um, and the feeder gum rig. They just weren't. And I can only assume that's because of the way that the rig was working. You know, when you think that you've got your feeder, you've got your, whether it be a stop shot, a stop start or a, some sort of a bead to stop the feeder behind that with a normal rig, you've just got mono, you've got mono to your hook length. All right. So, or it might be your leader to a mono hook length. Okay. Whereas with the power gun rig, you've actually got a bit of, well, it's, it's rubber power gun there, whatever length you decide on. And then you've got your mono coming off that. And I can only assume that when the fish is picking up the bait, like they are the shy bite in Carasio, that they're feeling that, that power gun there. That's the only thing I can think of. And they're either dropping the bait or you're not getting the bite as good because the fish is literally feeling something. Whereas with a more conventional rig with a normal shot leader, you haven't got any of that between the feeder and the actual hook bait. I might be wrong, but I think that might be why. But I'd be interested to hear what you think to that. Um, so many people logging on. I didn't expect so many tonight. Thank you, everybody, especially as this was unannounced. Uh, Ryan Forrest, how's the new clothing, Jamie? Up to now, I've got to say, Ryan, that it's absolutely brilliant, but I've only wore it three times. Um I mean, there are a couple of people within Matrix that have told me, now I'm quoting them, all right, so I don't know yet, but they have literally said it's it, it's as good as Gore-Tex. I don't know if that's right. You know, I'm hoping it is right because I haven't tested mine. I'm hoping it's right because they've said it. Um, and I'm obviously hoping it's right because I'd like to think that, you know, the tri-layer clothing that Matrix have just brought out is a fantastic product. And up to now, for me, that's been absolutely bang on. I was out with someone... Um, two days ago coaching on a venue and he was actually out when he, he sat in torrential rain for the full day the week before in the new clothing and he says none of it got through he said none of the rain got through um and he's nothing to do with matrix so i'm hoping that's exactly how all the clothing is going to be so up to now ryan it's looking absolutely brilliant and it is much thicker than the original clothing you can fit the actual thickness so you know i dare say that's going to make it warmer as well but like I say, I've only worn mine three times. And one of those sessions, it didn't rain. And the other one, I was coaching. So I was on my feet all day. So it's not quite the same as it is when you sat there, especially when it's raining when you're fishing. But I will keep you posted, Ryan. John Tipton. Hi, John. Hi, Jamie. Fishing Loch Erne and area. My dad used to add curry powder or spicy powders to his ground bait in winter. Have you tried it or heard of people doing it? Yes, I have, John. I've heard of people doing it. However, I've never done it. The, that, I mean, anything like around that subject always reminds me of a particular ground, well, one or two ground bait mixers that I got involved in. And it was with Vandenind. When I was doing the Buyer's Guide series on this channel, if you haven't seen that, there is a playlist on this channel um, that is dedicated to trying out um, ground baits, basically. Shop, bought, off-the-shelf ground baits. You know, because the reason why I did that is because, you know, some of the ground baits here in the UK are going to co they cost five, six pound there might even be some that are encroaching on seven pounds a bag, you know, and it can work out expensive to just buy a mix to just to try, you know, and not everybody's got the luxury of doing that. And that's why I did that series. And certainly a couple of the mixers from Van der Nind, that is what they said. You know, they said that they were spicy mixers. However, and you might be able to, you know, give me a bit more uh, information or feedback on this. The general term that they said is that the spicier mixers were used for targeting roach, and in particular, big roach. Now, I'd be interested to hear if that if you've seen that trend, John. But in answer to your question, no, I've never done it. I do know about it, but those mixers are spicy mixers. I can't remember the name of them, unfortunately. Uh, I think I did do one buyer's guide series on it, so it is one of the Van der Nine mixers. Um, so, yeah, if that's something that anyone's interested in, then I know they've got a big range of spicier ground baits. Chris Buckley, Luke wasn't on my match on Springvale. There was quite a few matches on there today. Yeah, I think it was a club match, um, Chris. Uh, but, yeah, I hope the weather's not been too bad for you. Uh, Andrew Garner. Hi, Andrew. Thanks, Jamie. Quite new to the channel and Patreon. Thank you for becoming a member to that. Thank you. Appreciate that, mate. Great videos and really enjoy them. That's great, Andrew. Let me know if you want to see any particular comment, any, sorry, any particular content, and I'll get producing videos for you. Nick Mitchell. Hi, Jamie. Love the videos. Do you have any plans for more European events subject to COVID, such as Walter Land Feeder? Um, I've always had plans to do that, Nick, you know, but the biggest problem has always been, you know, a lot of the competitions that we could have gone and fished in Europe, without sounding too disrespectful to them, they weren't quite big enough or prestigious enough 
to justify the costs and time to go over there and travel. You know, that's that's the only reason. You know, I've had this I had this discussion probably seven years ago, eight years ago, with some of the members of the England team and anglers that are very high up within some of the big tattle brands that you all know. Um, and they literally said, you know, even back then, this is seven, eight years ago, they said that because there were so many small matches here in the UK that a lot of the matches are kind of watered down a little bit instead of going and being able to fish an 80 pegger or a 90 pegger instead of that happening there are like a 20 pegger here there's a 20 pegger there a 20 pegger there and those matches aren't for everybody you know they're not for me right now every now and then I'll fish an, um, a match like that you know it's sometimes nice to fish a match where there's not much riding on it you know it's just an open knock up but most anglers, certainly with um, big, uh, what's the word, um, ambitions in angling, or they've got a certain plan or a goal, or a long-term goal that they're after, they said to me, even like I said seven years ago, that they wouldn't fish any open matches back here in England. But if there was one major or big European match, say mainland France, Holland, Belgium, then they would literally go and do that instead. So they would literally go and fish a two, three, four day trip over to Europe to fish a feeder event like that and just not bother with those little knock-ups back home. And they, they would do that every single month. And to be absolutely honest with you, I would do the same as well, even now, seven years on. But unfortunately, those events haven't been there. But Walterland is a Walterland has, has, has been something that I've always wanted to compete in. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, just because of the circumstances of the event itself, the logistics of getting there, and 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 having team members to travel with, I've just never had a chance to fish it. All right, simple as that. We wanted to fish it this year. I'll be absolutely honest with you, but it was so close to the World Club final that we just couldn't do it. You know, a lot of the lads now, as you can appreciate, they're obviously a little bit older than the, what they were eight years ago. A lot of them, or most of them, now are married. You know, they've got they've obviously got wives, they've got kids. Um, and some of them have still got jobs as well. And, you know, when we went to Bulgaria for the for the, for the World Club final, we were away 10 days. Now, you know, if we'd gone to Walterland, we didn't have time to go home and then go to Walterland. We literally, because we had it all planned, we were going to do it. We was going to do it. Basically, we would have had to finish the event um, on the Sunday evening at the presentation from the World Club final and then literally get back in the vans and then drive in the vans to Hungary for five, six days or whatever it would have been to go and compete in that event. And it just would have meant too many days away uh, away from their families. Simple as that. It was just too much. Um, so that's the only reason why uh, we didn't do Walterland this year. But if I could get to some of these events individually, if they are individual events, because obviously team events, you're relying on other anglers, uh, you know, and those other anglers have obviously got to be uh, as flexible as you. And so it's just been really difficult, Nick, but for me, if I, if I knew there was, say, a two- or three-day event every month somewhere in Europe, then I would do that, and that is all I'd fish. I, I Certainly now, for the next two or three years or whatever, that is all I'd do. So, yeah, that's the only reason why, Nick, you know. But like I say, had the opportunities been there, I, I definitely would have fished more. But if those opportunities arise, um, and I'm sure a lot of you, yourself included, Nick, if you've seen the video from the World Championships this year in France and what we discussed after the event, as a team, then, you know, if all that is going to um, uh, still be the case, then I'm sure some of the other lads will be getting over there as well to, um, to, 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 to build on our knowledge of fishing in mainland Europe. So I hope I haven't waffled on that, Nick, but there we go. Sean Elliott, I've three aqueous feeder rods. Can you recommend a glass tips that could fit these rods? I fish Sally Walsh's dam for the roach and skimmers on brain braid so would like a softer tip on these rods um i can't to be honest sean because i don't know what tips will fit them um i mean you've said glass i don't use any glass tips i've been asked this a lot i only ever use carbon tips that is it i never ever use um, glass tips so i don't know what glass tips would fit them unfortunately not without going and trying them so i'm sorry about that sean but i mean what strength tips are you using uh, I haven't fished that dam. I am aware of it. You know, I know where it is and everything and the style of fishing. But, I mean, what sort of strength tips are you after, mate? If you can let me know. Nigel Bennett, thanks for the winter tips, Jamie. Really appreciate your time. No problem, Nigel. Thank you for watching, mate. Um, 
Martin Brunning, you had a cheeky sunbed session, Jamie. Positively glowing, my friend. No, that's because the lights here are warm. I've just had a shave and a shower. Um, so that's all it is. No, I haven't had a cheeky sunbed session. I'd like a cheeky 10-day um, sunbed on a beach session. That would be really nice right now. Um, but no, I haven't. No, I haven't. But thank you anyway. <laughs> BT, that's Christmas Day TV boxed off. Yeah, it will. I will find out when that exactly is, actually. I think it's going to be Christmas Day. The Submerge um, video is going to go. I'm sure it's Christmas Day. Um, thank you for so many people logging on. I didn't expect so many tonight. Thank you for that. Um, prime time. I'm from the People's Republic of Scotland. Dictatorship land. Fantastic. <laughs> What you like for venues up there? I know it's a different world up there from what it is down here, isn't it? Um, Leslie, when you do underwater footage with Rob Hughes, did you expect some results and shot by others? Um, Leslie, I'll be absolutely honest with you. Um, right. I mean, I, I was I did the very first submerged film, as you probably remember, with Rob Hughes, the very, very first one. And that was the one that opened a lot of people's eyes about how close your hook bait was actually landing to your feeder. Now, you know, that's one of those things that we we kind of knew anyway. And it was something that for the last few years, just knowing that as, as it's won me quite a bit of money, especially in winter, things like that, you know. And, you know, but there were other things that were a surprise, but it confirmed. I think that's the right word to say. It confirmed a lot of things that what we thought were right, but there were one or two surprises in there as well. And it's one of those funny series, as you know, I'll be absolutely honest with you. You know, I think, you know, I'm not daft um, and I love to share my experiences with you. But, you know, at the end of the day, what we do through the media channels, what we do if you're connected with a with a tattle brand or if you're connected with a bait brand, there you've got media duties, you know, depending on what you deal and what your contract is and what you want to do and what you're involved in. And so we love sharing experiences with you. But at the end of the day, you know, we're not like um, many uh, people producing YouTube content out there. You know, there are some massive fishing channels out there. Uh, you know, I'm fully aware of them, but they're not based around competition fishing. Simple as that. You know, they're, they're based, the really big channels are all about having a day's fishing, pleasure fishing, different styles of fishing. You know, those channels might go sea fishing one minute, pike fishing, bass fishing. There's all sorts out there, you know, but this is very different because, you know, whilst I'm here doing this right now, you know, in a few days' time, I'll be competing in a match for money, in some cases, a lot of money, prestige. I will have travelled a long way to get there, prepped a lot for that. However, when I look to my left and look to my right, there might be some of you there sat next to me, you know, and so we want to share our experiences with you. But videos like that are kind of um, sharing stuff that we'd love, some of it we'd love to keep for ourselves. They're really, you know, because it's so valuable or we think it is. Um, so it's one of those kind of things, you know, you sometimes get mixed feelings on some of the things, but I think confirming a lot of the things is the main thing. You know, we, we thought there were lots of things happening underwater and it did confirm some. However, there were some surprises, you know, there were some surprises. Um, and yeah, it, it's been really interesting. It's been really interesting to hear the feedback because everybody, when you watch a video like that, some of the things people perceive and, and um, what's the word? they kind of interpret them in a different way from other people, you know, and some people have just accepted that, oh, that's rubbish. Um, there's nothing you can do about that. But then you get the other set of people out there that have come up to me and say, Jamie, on the back of watching that video, I've designed this to, to combat this. Or now when I'm fishing, I do this. And, and that's really interesting. I love to hear all that, but it's nice to get some facts. You know, when I was a kid, I've said it before on here a long time ago, that when I was a kid, my dad taught me that always and never doesn't exist in fishing. You know, there are no rules. You know, there are things that often work better than others. Um, but always and never doesn't exist. We never quite know what's going to happen. You know, we don't know what's happening out there underneath the water. We think we do. And that series has kind of confirmed a lot of things. It's given us some facts for a change. And I think that's great, you know, because we do a lot of guessing. A lot of it's opinion work um, and a lot of it is interpretation. But it's nice to get some facts. And, yeah, long may that series continue. It's not a cheap series to produce by any means. 
you know, as you can expect, you know, if there's two media guys on the bank, there's at least one angler. You've got Rob there as well. There's all those people's time, travel. And then there's obviously even after that, they've got to go away and produce that video as well. And and it's released free. You know, it's not a vin, it's not going on a DVD that's purchased. It's free, you know. And I, I think it's a, a, a great gesture and investment from Matrix to continue that series. Um, so I'm glad it's been I'm glad it's been supported so well. So thank you to everybody who's been watching it. Um, Ned, hi Jamie. I'm from the Midlands in Ireland. Shannon is now in flood, but my advice for any visiting angler is fish the harbours where the roach and hybrids are now shoaling up out of the main river. That's a great one, that one, Ned. Thank you for that. Yeah, anybody what is new to fishing, you know, if you're, you know, if you're fishing in rivers, you know, some people don't have a, a huge selection of venues. That's one thing I have learned, and it's one thing that we can easily forget that some people live in parts of the country where. You know, they might not be able to travel far. Some people haven't even got a car or a van. They go there on a bike or some people go fishing on a bus, believe it or not, still. But some people have to do that. And so, you know, having the luxury of a variety of venues is not always the case. So if you only fish a river or you've only got a river near you and it's in flood, go for the dead water, as they call it. You know, any sort of slack water. You might might be an inlet where a canal comes into it or some sort of an eddy or near lock gates or where two rivers join. It often creates slacks, trees that have fallen in, any sort of features like that. If there's a bridge there, sometimes the bridges have staunchions and behind the staunchions is where the slack water is. And that's often where the fish go to get out of that main flow when they're in flood and get out of all that dirty water that's getting in the gills and stuff. So that's a great one, that one, Ned. Um, yeah, it's location is key in winter. It's massive anyway, but certainly on flooded rivers, but be safe. That's the main thing. If you're going anywhere near flooded rivers, please, please be careful. You know, it's just not worth taking any chances, you know, and if it isn't too good, then try and make sure you're not on your own. Try and get a mate to go with you. So there's always two of you there and always let people know where you're going. You know, uh, I've seen lots of near misses on flooded rivers, lots of near misses, even by experienced anglers. Um, you know, but my best bit of advice on that is certainly if you feed a fish in, you don't have to go and sit right on the edge of the water. You know, we see it all the time in feeder fishing. I see people wading out to their waist and they're still feeder fishing at 30 meters. You know, and I don't I, I don't get all that, you know, just be safe. You know, you don't have to go wading out when you're feeder fishing. Stay up the bank. <laughs> but thanks for that, Ned. Um, no problem, Stephen. Um, Sander T, greetings from Estonia. Please let me know what's the fishing like in Estonia. I would love to hear. And what kind of species are you after? Uh, John Ferrer, stay up, Jamie. How's tricks? Really well, thank you, John. I've not seen you for a hell of a long time, mate. It's years since I've seen you. I hope you're all right, mate. Lars, do you have any tips for fishing matches on fast-flowing rivers, such as the, um, the Isel? Greetings from Holland. The only thing I know about that... that river is that it's a man's venue i have got a friend who fishes there every year well two friends actually go there every year um and it's all about heavy feeders fast flowing rivers and and strong rods so you know assuming you've got the tackle to tackle it what you've got to think about is that you know i've never fished there but what i know is that you're often fishing with quite heavy feeders feeders that are going to hold the bottom all right, so whatever kind of weights you can get away with, you know, don't always go right out in the flow. On faster flowing rivers, you can often catch very, very close. Certainly if you've got a bit of depth there as well. And if you're casting heavy feeders, just gear all your tackle up accordingly. You know, if you're having to cast, if I talk in ounces, it depends, you know, we've got to be careful these days. We're talking ounces, people want it in grams and vice versa, depending on where you are in the world. You know, you might be fishing with three, four, five ounce feeders, sometimes even heavier. You know, you're talking upwards of 100 gram feeders upwards. You know, if you're going to be fishing with feeders like that, you need the line to to um, to cope with that. Um, you've got to be prepared for snags. Some of these big rivers are snaggy. So you got to, don't just rock up with two or three feeders. Make sure you've got a few feeders with clip on leads so you can add weight to them to make sure that they're going to hold bottom depending on the flow that you're faced with. And you're going to need the rods to fish it. All right. You're going to need rods that are in the 130 gram upwards kind of strength. All right. And you're going to need the tips to go with them as well. Please don't try and fish like that with a one ounce tip. You know, you're going to need a strong tip, at least four ounce, could be five ounce, could be, you know, just gear everything up. That's the best thing, you know. And because you're fishing such heavy feeders on faster flowing rivers, 
gear you you know quite often you need to gear up your hooks as well your hook length strength but a nice big hook as well because the last thing you want to be doing is hooking 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 fish in fast fast flowing water with such a heavy feeder on when you've got a little hook on you're just going to pull the hook out you know you need a nice strong hook um, but yeah, really exciting fishing. I, that's something that I'm hoping, not on that particular river, but certainly on the UK rivers, it's the kind of fishing I want to be doing a little bit more of this winter. And I'm really looking forward to that. I'm filming them se the sessions for you. Uh, Darren Croft, when using inline feeders interchangeable, is there a way to help stop tangles? What tangles are you getting, please, Darren? The only tangle I can think you're possibly getting is the, if you're fishing with a four inch hook length, is the maggot and hook length going over the top? of the stem it, it that must be the only tangle is that the tangle you're talking about darren if you can let me know please mate christoph's here how are you doing christoph hope you're well mate i don't interact with you like we used to everyone's really busy mate i like the new suit but i haven't used it in very rainy conditions yet i'm the same christoph i'm the same i don't want it to rain i hope i never have to try it in the rain but i'm sure i will uh, but i'm glad you like it <laughs> uh hi do you have any tips to catch less bream and more average size carp. The biggest problem, I don't know where you are um, in the world, um, but I had a problem. When I first started getting getting back into my fishing, um, probably eight years ago, nine years ago, I was fishing a particular commercial venue, and it was one where there was lots of qualifiers on there. And what I basically found that there were lots of bream in there, not, not enough to win a match with. There were bream in there, but not enough to win a match with. But I was fishing the method feeder there, and I used to go there in January, February, and March, and I always used to spend the first hour trying to catch a carp. And to be absolutely honest with you, for the first two years, I was absolutely rubbish at it. I don't think I even caught one. And anglers around me would get one or two. They weren't after many, and to be absolutely honest with you, on most occasions, you were only after one. You'd get one, and then you need to put some skimmers and bream and other fish together with that, and that will give you a chance of doing well because the carp weren't feeding very well. However, I just never caught one. But what I did do is that on quite a few occasions, I caught bream. Now, I didn't catch a lot of them. One of them, one of the times it happened, it was probably the last time it happened, I fished the first hour for a carp. I was hoping it was going to be a big carp to set my match off before I went fishing for skimmers and bream. But what happened was that first hour, I didn't catch a carp, but I caught four bream. But the bream were three pound a piece. So after that first hour, I hadn't caught a carp, but I caught 12 pound a bream, which basically meant I'd caught the equivalent of a carp. So on that particular case, in that scenario, it, it, it wasn't a disaster. It was OK. But on all the other occasions, I would sit there and sometimes we were leaving it in 15, 20 minutes, like you do in winter when it's hard. And whenever I got an indication or whenever, whenever I got a, a pull or a drop back or whatever, it was always a skimmer. And, you know, some days I'd get three or four fish on the method feeder for about two pound. And then someone next to me would get one bite and it would weigh 16 pound. And it got really annoying after two years. And that's when I went away and I thought there's something really wrong here. You know, you know, I was casting the same sort of distance. The rig was the same and all that sort of stuff. The bottom line. The moral of the story was um, I was using ground bait and pellet combination. And what was happening was that the, the skimmers and the bream were finding the ground bait and they were getting to the bait before any carp was getting getting a chance. And that was quite an important thing that I took, um, took on board in my fishing because for the following winter, I never used ground bait. When I was targeting solely the carp, I cut the ground bait out completely and just used micro pellets and some boily crush. And it was amazing, the difference. I just didn't get any skimmers whatsoever. And then when I did get a fish, it was a carp. And I think the following January, I went and won the match with about £120 of carp. In January, I won the match. It was a Boston Masters qualifier. And I didn't catch any skimmers. And I didn't catch any after that either. Um, so that was an important lesson. But it was an important lesson because it worked both ways. On the complete flip side of that, I was fishing a match there the following winter. I drew a peg that was very hit and miss. And I fished for two and a half hours for a carp with pellets, and I never caught one. But nobody in the section had caught a carp either. So on the flip side of what I'd learned from that lesson was halfway through the match, I mixed and changed to using ground bait and pellets around the feeder. And I caught seven bream in seven casts. 
and that went on to win the section. I won the section, which was £100. So it worked both ways. From that lesson, I learned that I could almost tailor make it to the target fish that I was targeting, if that makes sense. But that was the biggest lesson. I don't know if that's going to help you out or not, but basically I cut the ground bait out. I don't even know if you're using ground bait, but if you're using pellets, boiler crush has been massive. You know, it depends on the type of venue that you're fishing. If you're fishing a venue that gets specimen fished, then those venues are seeing lots of crush boilers, lots of particle baits. It depends on the type of venue, obviously, on the, the bait that's going in. So if it is heavily specimen fished, have a look at what the specimen carp anglers are using because, you know, they are probably fishing it more than what matchmen and pleasure anglers are. And in my experience, they'll be feeding a lot more than we will be feeding as well. So that's, you know, that's what the fish are going to be used to. I hope that helps. <laughs> um, right, who else is here? Andy Phelps is here. Good evening, Andy. Hope you're well, mate. Uh, Van der Nijn, I have a lot of spicy herb mixes. Thank you, Andy. I'm glad you've logged on to that because I couldn't remember the name of the mixes when I was talking about them. Uh, herb mixes that are excellent for winter fishing. Just used G5 Special for a German article, and also my latest video combined with Van der Nijn, Big Roach had loads of fish. Thanks for that, Andy. I'm glad you're still getting out and doing some filming as well, mate, um, doing your magazine stuff. Um, Royal Catch, I buy last year the advanced courses. Helped me a lot to improve. Thank you. Continue the good work and some more natural deep water tactics. Okay, I have got some lined up for this winter, so and that's obviously uh, what you're interested in from the Ukraine. But I'm glad the course has helped you out. That's brilliant to hear. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, well, I'm going to go treat myself after Christmas and get some new clothing and go with Matrix. I'll let you know, obviously, by then. It's a few weeks away, Ryan, but, you know, you'll, I'll know by then, mate. I'm sure I'm going to get rained on a lot since then, and uh, it's going to get colder as well, isn't it? Um... Fishing Sammy style. Hi, Jamie. Hook me up and I'll put £200 of French bream in your net. Uh, five hours in January. I'm all about the winter fishing south of France. Jump on a plane and I'll see you right. That sounds fantastic to me. I am. I've got to let you know about this sort of thing because I need to let you know what's happening with the channel. I am planning fishing trips in order to film more um, interesting content for you. And that will be involved. Uh, that will involve traveling over to Europe as well. I've got lots and lots planned, same in Ireland. Um, so there's loads of content of that nature coming for you. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to sharing those with you. So thank you for that. Sammy Style, can I call you that? Andrew Gardner, any tips on attaching braid to mono or shock leaders? as it's totally new to me. Also, we used to always add turmeric to our bronze maggots when fishing the rivers back in the day. Yes, I remember. I never actually did that, Andrew, uh, the turmeric thing, but loads of people I fished with did. I remember that quite, you know, obviously giving it that spiciness. Um, but the lad that I was with two days ago coaching, he actually had some maggots with him and he got turmeric on his, interestingly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as regards knots, I've only ever used one knot for my shock leader, shock leader knots. Um, and I've done a video for it on my membership channel, on Match Fishing channel. Um, but I don't think you're a member, are you? There is one on the Matrix channel um, that is there for you. So let me just see if I can, let me just see if I can quickly find it. I don't know if I'm, I won't be able to find it now for you. I'll post it underneath this video for you. But if you go to the Matrix YouTube channel, there is one on there. Type in search word, just put shock leader or shock leader knot or Jamie Harrison shock leader knot. I think it's part of the Fishing Basics series or Back to Basics. That's it. There will be a playlist for Back to Basics and there's a, a knot in there and that is the only knot I use. I was taught that knot 10 years ago and I haven't had reason to change it. It's the smallest knot I've ever seen. It's super, super strong and it goes through the runners on your rod really easily because it is so small and it's really strong. I haven't had chance, uh, any reason to change it, so that's the one that I stick with. It's like a version of an Albright knot. It's a, I don't think it's got an official name. I've never heard anyone give it an official name. It's like an Albright knot. Uh, but, yeah, if you head on over to that channel, there will be on there for you, um, Andrew. Uh, Fishing Sammy Style, please email me with your friends. I live in France and want to help. I will do. Email me as well, please. Otherwise, in fact, I'll put my email address here. Um, I'm going to make sure it's this, the right one for you, just in case. There we go. So 
So there's my email address. So just in case I forget, because when I switch this computer off, I've got more editing to do. I've got two videos for the membership channel, which will be going on tomorrow. Oh, no, there's one on tomorrow. Um, and then there's loads this week. I can't even begin to tell you what's going on that channel. Um, so there we go. Um, your, your love is my drug. That's a fantastic log on that one. Do you have do you have an age limit for your coaching sessions? My 16-year-old daughter thinks you are awesome and would love to take a coaching session. No, I mean, if it's a one... Do you mean... Yeah, it's not coaching. If it's coaching, I mean, 16-year-olds, I just ask if there can be, you know, um, a parent or guardian with them, that's all. You know, it makes it so much easier, obviously, with them travelling there. And to be quite honest, some days, you know, if the weather's not very nice... Um, then, you know, sometimes people by one o'clock or two o'clock might want to pack up and go home. And if there's somebody there, obviously, to, that can give them a lift home or take them home and all that sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, that, that's all. Um, but yeah, please get in touch if you want to order, book any sorts of sessions. I don't put any really dates up for next year. Um, I have cancelled quite a few, not cancelled them, but I've taken quite a few dates off the website for one-to-one -one sessions. The reason for that is because, I don't want to do too many of them. I want and I want to keep them quite kind of not exclusive, but I just don't want to do too many of them, you know, and that's why there aren't too many dates on there. But there are some dates on there at the moment. In fact, what I'll do, I'll add this link there for you because there are also a couple of places left on our last or our final group coaching days of the year. There's the link there for you. That should be in the chat. Um, myself and Dean Barlow's group coaching days. We've got two back to back at Lindholm Lakes in a couple of weeks' time. There are a couple of places left. They will sell out, but there are a couple of places left if anyone's interested in those. The first one is winter winter feeder fishing on commercials. I will be doing the demonstration for that one. That is on one one of the lakes at Lindholm Lakes. The cafe's open there as well, so we'll all be able to have a nice breakfast together and something to eat afterwards, if you wish. And then the following day, Dean is instructor on that one, and he is demonstrating pole fishing, commercial pole fishing in winter. That's the following day. There are two days there back to back. So if anyone's interested in those, you can book on one of them or both of them, if you wish. It's entirely up to you. There are only a couple of places left. They will sell out, so I'm just letting you know about those. Uh, but I've just put a link in the chat if anyone's interested in those. And that's a link to the website for the one-to-one -one days as well. Right. Let me see if I can catch up on some of these messages. Sean Elliott, in 11-foot in eleven foot rod, it's a one ounce. And the 11-foot eight, it's one and a half ounce. And 12-foot eight inch, it's one and a half ounce. Just prefer glass tips. I feel carbon can be a little harsh. Yeah, I understand, mate. Um, I, I rarely use a tip less than an ounce, but unfortunately, Sean, I don't know any glass tips that are going to fit it. I, I'm sorry, mate. I'd be completely guessing, and I don't want you to go ordering kit, you know, based on me guessing. I'm sorry, mate. Um, Matthew Stevenson, I always go fishing and never catch. Do you? <laughs> I don't believe that, mate. I don't believe that for a minute. John Turner. John Turner, just a quick question. How much preparation time do you give your tattle and bait before a match? Great channel to content. Thanks, John. Uh, it depends on the match. depends on the style of fishing that you're doing. One of the things you've got to remember about match prep, and this is something that I've learned a lot about myself over the last 18 months, and that is, I'll, I'll, quote, I'll quote an angler now. I'll quote Will Raisin. All right. A few years ago, I was fortunate enough to, to go over to uh, Merida um, in Spain for the European Float Championship. I wasn't fishing it. I was there covering it for MatchAngler.com with Dave Johnson. And we got very, um, um, very involved with the England anglers, the England float anglers. So that's Will Raisin. You know, I think um, Sean Ashby was there and Alan Scotton and the team were there, Mark Downs. And basically, there are a lot of things that we learned about you know, the kind of preparation that they put in at that level, you know, it was incredible the amount of preparation that they put in. But one of the th things I remember from that trip, and that was Will Raisin, he remembered, he, he said one thing to me, you know, and it, it's always stuck with me since. Um, and I've seen examples of this since. And that was basically, John, he says that the best preparation for a match is done on the bank when you get to your peg. Simple as that. All right. But obviously you've got to go to your peg with all your bases covered. You know, so just basically what I do is I think about all the eventualities that you might come across. So, you know, it's such a vague topic to talk about, really, because there are so many different venues. But look at all the eventualities. All right. That what what you might be faced with. But also have a look at the realistic methods that you might be using. So, for example, um, if you're going to a match where 20 pound might win the match, 
and there are carp in there, bream, skimmers, roach, perch, all right? Have a realistic think about what's going to get you £20. You know, are you really good at catching carp? Do you know the best way of catching carp? In which case, you might want to sit on the method all day and fish for two carp and get your £20 that way, or one carp. However, are you better at catching silverfish? Is it more likely that you're going to get plenty of bites from, from silverfish that you're going to get your £20 that way? You know, just, just think about that. But as regards, I mean, you've asked, I don't want to wander off the subject, but you've put how much preparation time? I put in as much as it takes, all right? And, you know, and this is why 10 years ago or nine years ago, I went down the route of focusing on feeder fishing. Because I didn't have the time. I was in a full-time job. I had two full, well, a full-time job, a part-time job. I was working on other stuff as well. I didn't have the time to prepare that you need to put in if you're going to be pole fishing, waggler fishing, feeder fishing, whip fishing. I just couldn't do it. I just didn't have enough time. Because when you're fishing all those methods, you know, the amount of time you need to put in is incredible if you want to compete. And that was part of the reason why I specialised on feeder fishing. Yes, there was an amazing opportunity presented when I got invited to that first ever um, England feeder team trial. Um, obviously, I didn't get picked that year, but that set me down the route. It gave me a target to focus on. And as it turned out, one or two feeder fishing events start to open out then, which gave me more to get involved in. So that's what I did, John. So I don't get loads of time to prepare on kit. All right. And to be absolutely honest with you, I don't want to spend too much time preparing kit. I've never wanted to be a full-time angler. Um, I, I think some people think I am, and I'm not. I'm not a full-time angler. Over the last six to eight weeks, I've pretty much lived like a full-time angler because we've had so many big, important events coming up that I've had to literally spend hours and hours and hours prepping my kit, sorting my gear out, sorting the bait out, sorting out the logistics of getting to these events, sorting out your digs, all that sort of stuff. So I have literally been like a full-time angler for the last eight weeks or so, but I, I don't want to be like that and I won't be like that because I, I enjoy the media side of it and my business side of it. Um, so, I mean, time, I don't have to spend too much time on my kit. And there's a couple of reasons for that, John. The first reason is a lot of the sorts of venue fishing that I do is quite similar. And by that, I obviously mean it's feeder fishing. But if you're going to commercials, I've got a good set and selection of barbless hooks. All right. I fish natural venues as well, but I've got a good selection of barbed hooks that we can use that are suited to natural venues. I have one box for barbless patterns. I have another box for my barbed patterns. I have another box with my method feeder patterns. And with hook lens, I learned this off some of the biggest names in angling where if you struggle to get time to prep, then one of the best bits of advice I can give you is to, you know, if you've got a tray or something, Put all your hook tying gear in, on that tray and leave it somewhere in the house where it's laid out. Because what happens is, if you're anything like me, it's very rare that you're going to get a two-hour block to spend uninterrupted to prepare your kit for the weekend. You know, there's not many people that have that luxury. And I don't really get that luxury because, you know, I've got other stuff to do. So what we find is that most people with busy lives, they might get 15 and 20 minutes or even half an hour blocks. Well, if that's the case, that will give you the opportunity to go to wherever that tray is and just tie up 10 hook lengths or five. You know, and if you find you can do five hook lengths a day, after a week or two weeks, you've got a really nice collection there that's going to carry you on for weeks. So we tend to break our preparation down into blocks like that if you're very busy, if you've got family and kids and all that sort of stuff in your job. All right. So that's one thing. But the other thing I've done as well, John, is that I try. And this is a luxury that not a lot of people can do, but I try and do it wherever I can. I usually have got rods set up for fishing commercials and I have rods set up for fishing natural venues. So more often than not, my natural water rods might be the slims. More often than not, I'm using them with braid. So I leave them set up just like my commercials. When I'm going fishing for carp, I never fish for braid, never use braid. I always use mono. So I have a couple of method feeder rods that are permanently set up with mono on them. All right, simple as that. And if you can't spare the reels to be on those rods all the time when you're not using them, where well, you can just take the spool off, just put an elastic band or just attach that spool to the rod, put the rod to one side, and then you've got your reel. 
and then just go to your other rod, put that spool on that ready rod, and if you're sharing reels that way. So there's lots of little things I do like that, John, you know, but above else, everything else, I just try and stay organised. I know where all my pellets are, I know where my ground baits are. So if I have literally only got 20 minutes to get ready for a match, I can go straight to everything, take it out, put that in, put that in. Just like all my feeders, my feeders are all separated in boxes. So I have a nice box, that sh a shallow box with all my little cage feeders in. It's got the word pond written on it because that means it basically means when I'm fishing a pond, a small pond, all my little feeders are in there. OK, just like on the flip side of that, I've got a deep box that's got the word river on it or flow. It actually says flow for flowing water. And they're all my river feeders. Just like I've got another one that's got all my method feeders in. It's got my open method feeders in, normal method feeders and pellet feeders. All right. So that means that, you know, if I know I'm going to be commercial, I'm going to be fishing with the method. I can just go into the tackle room, pick that one box up with all my method feeders in, put that in my bag. I'm done. It's just little things like that. I probably rambled on that one, John. I'm sorry, but I want to help out wherever I can, mate. <laughs> um, Simon Beely. Hi, Jamie. What's your favorite method or cage feeder? And carp or bream. Um, <laughs> I don't really have favourite. Believe it or not, my favourite method of all time at the moment is the pellet waggler. I love the pellet waggler because it's such an active way of fishing. It's exciting because a lot of the bites are coming really quickly. You're usually catching bigger fish and it rewards or usually rewards the hardest working anglers. And I like that. So I love method feeder fishing. I think it's absolutely brilliant when you get it working right. It's just unbeatable. But if I had to pick the method feeder over cage or vice versa, I'd have to go down the cage route. And that's really because fishing with the cage feeder, depending on what you're fishing for, you, you've got more input into it as regards trying to make bites happen, trying to make something happen. You know, you, it's a little bit more of an active way of fishing. And I generally do better with that. Just because a lot of the time you can do something to make a bite happen. With the method feeder, yes, there are things that you can do to try and trigger bites or trigger fish. Of course, there are always, there's always things you can do. But with the cage feeder, I just feel as though you're working it a little bit more. So, yeah, for me to be a cage feeder. <clears throat> Fishing Sammy style, Iberian Masters this year. Is it happening? If so, I'll compete. I need a quick drink of this coffee. Yes, it is happening. 2022, the Iberian Masters, I have been told as of about four days ago that it is going ahead. All right. But I will say to you that the organisers, I am led to believe, are giving everybody who competed in it last year or the last event, they're giving all those people first refusal at booking onto it. OK, so, yes, I've been told it is going ahead. Um so, yeah, it'd be great to see you there if you are there. That'd be great. Um, right, let's uh, just have a quick look at these other questions here because I don't want to ignore everybody. Jamie, the roach additive that Van der Eind uh, was very spicy from memory. A lot of fire spice. Yep, very spicy, but I never really had a chance to use it. Um, Gino, how do you fancy cracking the slabs out in Germany just off the Rhine? If you look on Google Maps... Uh, I've won so many matches in the army, knowing the places. How how's Dad, by the way? Dad's very very well, thank you. He, he is he's very well, thank you. Um, yes, of course. Any trips like that, I'd be great to hear hear about. And obviously, there'd be great opportunities to film the the whole trip. And that's what I want to do more of. Well, that's what I am doing more of. You know, it's all it's on its way now. So, yes, any opportunities like that, I'd love to hear about them. Leslie, Jamie, if you could name one venue in England, either natural or commercial, you would fish. Where would it be your favourite? Wow. My problem is I like so many different venues. I don't really have favourites, um, but um i don't <laughs> great question great question it would have to be my my local reservoir damn flask reservoir you know that's where i fished a lot as a kid when i was growing up i used to go up there on the bus it's still beautiful scenery i've been up there today it was raining sideways it was that windy it was very very grim it was very cold but it looked absolutely stunning it looked fantastic so it's not a match venue by any means, but yeah, I suppose that's going back to my childhood a little bit. But even when I go up there now, you know, all these years on, you still get that love of just sitting there, even when you can't get a bite. 
So I, I guess that, that has to be my favourite, I think. <laughs> I added a long 15-metre mono, mono leader to braid just because I lost all three corps on take during practice days. I kept the 0.8mm feeder gum, so the only change was mono leader landed a small corp on day one. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't lose any corp in, in training at all. I landed every corp, you know, that I had, and I was fishing with braid and a, and a very short shot leader. So I think a lot of that as well is down to, you know, the rods that you're using as well. I was using quite a soft rod. So, um, yeah. Matthew Fry, hi, Matthew. Hi, Jamie. I'm going to Derwent Reservoir tomorrow. Lots of roach fishing on the feeder. Just wondering what feeder rig you recommend um i'm just almost exclusively using free running rigs now matthew especially for roach just because um obviously they're allowed on all venues free running rigs we use them in international fishing international events but i just found that i miss far less bites with a free running rig you can do more with a free running rig you know you can tighten your tip right up to it or you can slack line it you can slacken the tip off a little bit you can slacken it off completely and just completely slack line and wait for the fish um, to 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 pull the tip to make sure it's on, you know. So for me, just a free running rig. Um, if you like a twizzle boom, be like a twizzle boom. Um, but you don't always need the boom. It depends on your rig. So yeah, for me, a free running, free running rig. Um, I don't know what the water clarity is like. Your roach fishing, probably a nice dark mix, um, and just mix it up. Start off with a cage feeder. Get some fish in the swim. Get some bait falling through the water. And then change it to some sort of a plastic feeder, a more enclosed one, to get the fish down on the deck so yeah that sounds really nice fishing to be fair i've never fished it up there matt hackney jamie i'm really interested to know what hooks you use at tamar have to having to get them in quickly you need a hook you're confident in what's your go-to hook for this style of fishing please um there isn't one matt i've learned a lot about hooks recently um i've always known that hook pattern makes a big difference but because i've spent so much time on the bank over the last two months um i've really been able to i think a lot of you know that i'm not some sort of a sheep i don't i don't listen to what a top angler says and then automatically do it or go out and buy that product and copy it without me having tried it myself you know because you know i want to be using kit on for my own reasons for my own terms because if i've at least tested it and found it to be better then that keeps um it keeps my mind right because i've got confidence in it you know and, and and as we know confidence is a massive thing in our fishing as we all know so i tried three patterns out uh, at tamar i tried three i tried uh, a series 18 which is a hook that i know a lot of people use in ireland i also used the mx um, no, I didn't. I tried more because I, I had two visits to Tamar. It was the MXB2 and the MXB3 I tried. Um, so the MXB2 is 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 the narrower, finer wide gauge one. Um, it's a bit like a the, the Canasan B560 shape. It's, it's a bit like that. Um, so that's the MXB2 I used. I used the MXB3, which is the wider gate one, which is ideal for chunkier baits like worms and that sort of thing. So they were the, I think they were the only three. Oh, no, and I, I tried a super match, which is the old Matrix pattern, if you remember those. You can't get them anymore, or if you can, they're like gold dust. You know, they've been discontinued for at least two years now. So, yeah, the super match hook, it's a really fine hook, but it's very, very sharp. I've still got some of those left. So I tried those, and so they were the four patterns that I tried. Um, and I'm not quite sure what was best, to be fair. I think the one I caught the most fish on was the MXB2 because I was switching between maggot and worm, but I know the Series 18 was good as well. But um, I think I don't, I don't know how much of a difference it made at Tamar, to be fair. The biggest issue at Tamar for me was feeding. That was the biggest lesson I learnt. It, it, it wasn't, you know, about your rig so much. It wasn't about your hook pattern. Not so much the style of feeder, really. I mean, that did come into it, but it was more about the feeding and the way that you fed your peg. Um, so, yeah, so quite often we don't know what the best is without trying it. And that's why sometimes we'll go and fish like I did at Tamar and you might have four different patterns on in one session when you're trying to work it out. And sometimes it depends on the hook bait that you're using as well. Some patterns are better for maggots. Some patterns are better for worms. Um, and, um, and, and it can be, you know, as the, the species as well could dictate that, you know, you might find there's a better hook for roach 
as opposed to skimmers. So, you know, unless you know exactly what scenario you're faced with on that day, and sometimes you don't always know what the best pattern is without just trying it. And that's why sometimes you'll see us biting a hook length off and putting a new one on for no apparent reason. It's just because we're trying to make sure we're hitting as many bites uh, and, and landing as many fish as possible. Um, right, okay, let's have uh, a quick check of these. Um, Gary Adams, check out the reservoir in Suffolk, 300. Alton Water, I have heard of that one. I have heard of that one. And that is something that I'm looking at more now, different venues and stuff, okay. Uh, I've put a couple of links in the feed for the people that were asking about courses and coaching and stuff. Um, Sander T in Estonia, feeder fishing is getting more popular, but match fishing isn't. Oh, that's interesting. We fish only in natural venues. We fish for bream, skimmers, roach, tench, rud, bleak, chub, eyed, crucian. Wow. Why why isn't fishing getting popular? That's interesting. Uh, match fishing. I mean, it's great to hear about feeder fishing, especially me, obviously, having um, the basis of a feeder fishing channel. But uh, I'll be interested to hear why match fishing isn't. That's, um, I hope it's a good reason. Well, I don't know what, what would be a good reason, but I hope it's not a terrible reason. Uh, Chris Buckley, can't wait for Lindom. Yeah, good, mate. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing you there, mate. Uh, Ryan, have you ever used... Uh, uh, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry, Ryan. I feel rubbish not knowing what that is. No, I haven't. I haven't used it. I don't know what it is, but if you can tell me, I'll let you know if I know anyone who has, but I'm not sure what that is. Tony Chandler, good evening, Tony. Saturday night, and you sat watching the live stream. What's happening, mate? Hi, Jamie. Nice to find you on this channel. Really looking forward to the 27th. Yeah, Tony, you know, I mean, you've been a long-term member, I know, and uh, it's hugely appreciated. Uh, but yeah, I am doing the, the one a month on YouTube, so it's great to check in with everybody. I'm glad everyone's logging on tonight. Uh, Matt Hackney, your live coverage of the Golden Reel was fantastic. Will you be doing more coverage of big finals? Hopefully, you'll be in them. Hiya, Matt. Um, thanks for that, mate. Yeah, I actually enjoyed doing that. The thing with that, Matt, I've got to be absolutely honest with you that I would love to do one or two others, big finals, but um, I'm not quite sure how I would do them yet. All right, I've got to be, it's very much a, a sensitive issue. All right, um. Purely because, you know, uh, Phil Briscoe paid me to cover that for him. Obviously, for me to get a day away from work, travel 250 miles there and back um, to go and cover that for him uh, and produce the video afterwards. Um, there obviously was a, a cost to that. And Phil was over the moon. He's already asked me to cover the same event next year already uh, and every year. So that was great to hear from him. Um, but obviously, you know, there are some big major finals that are covered by by other companies, you know, there are certain big finals, whether it be BT Sport or Sky or whatever it might be. So if I was to go and cover those events, I couldn't cover them as an official um, kind of, uh, it wouldn't be official coverage. It would just be mine as a YouTuber sort of thing. And I'm not sure if I'd be able to do that in a, in a very good way. Um, but it is something I'd love to do, Matt. It, it really is. And, you know, I have been approached by one or two people to cover their events for them. Um, as, a, as a paid uh, private job, but I'd like to. That's the answer to it. And if I can do it in a good way, uh, in a, in an entertain, not an entertaining way, but in a nice way for you, an informative way, then I will do. But yeah, thanks for that, Mike. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you, Andrew Garner. Did you get the fishing bug off your dad? What species was your first fish and where? Uh, yeah, I think I did. I wasn't always into fishing. When I was a kid, I obviously got into it through my dad just going with my dad I used to sit with him at first and then gradually you know I just started fishing and you know just enjoyed that we used to back then it was all natural venues that was before commercial venues existed so I was very very fortunate I think to have grown up on those venues that you know there were lots of natural venues the river with them the river Trent and that, that's all year round as well you know we very much got to see those natural venues in their summer state as well as their winter state and in some cases they were very very different like the river with them for example in summer there was very little flow sometimes weedy in areas with lots of eels and that sort of thing but then in winter it was a completely different river you know it was shallower it used to be dropped down onto the, onto the winter level as they called it and it used to move and that's where i learned to fish with mainly the waggler um i was very i got very i had a lot of success with that fishing a nice waggler down 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 the river over depth just loves feeding maggots not fishing for big, big weights but i used to catch loads of roach really did well really did well at that you know i somehow got some sort of a knack for that 
I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and we used to go on the Yorkshire rivers as well, the River Nade, the, the River Swale, um, the, the smaller, faster flowing rivers. Um, and so I think a lot of that was just, yeah, just got in my blood. But then um, I lost interest a little bit. I used to go bird watching. I got, yeah, I joined the junior ornithology, ornithology, I still can't say it now, ornithology club or whatever it was called back then. Um, and I just used to, while my dad was fishing, I used to just go wandering for about five hours bird watching. And I used to love that when I was a, I was only young, very young teenager. Uh, and I used to love that, you know. And when I started doing that, the first thing my dad did was um, he put me through swimming lessons to make sure that when I was wandering around these rivers on my own while he was fishing, that if I did have any accidents and went for a swim, that I would be okay. Um, but then when I got to about 16, 17, my dad said to me, he says, if I could get you a, a, a trial for Sheffield Juniors, um, would you take it a little bit more serious? Would you be interested? Uh, and that's what happened. I got a trial for Sheffield Juniors. The trial was at Nottingham. It was on the River Trent on the Nottingham Embankment. I remember it really, really well. Um, and I got picked to fish for Sheffield. And that's when I started taking it more serious then, because that then led to an England trial. And then I got picked for England um, till I was 19. And then that was it for 20 years. Um, when I was 19, I went to college and university, got into work, got into a very active social life, as you do. Holidays, doing the things that you do. Um, and everything was on the back burner then until 2010. Um, and then that's when I got back into it again. So, yeah, it was it was in my, my blood from an early age. But, yes, that's what happens, you know. There's so many people got into fishing through the fathers. I think it's great. And I know a lot of people can relate to that. It's nice. Richard Webb, Jamie, if you pleasure fished a peg and had a great day, then drew that same peg the following day in a match, would you approach it and feed it exactly the same or change it slightly for a match? It's a great question that, you know, the thing is with that, Richard, is that, you know, I learned from certainly from day one in this year's Feeder Masters final at Tamar Lakes that, you know, sometimes what you do on one day can be completely different the following day, even if you're in the same area, you know. But in hindsight, you know, why would you do anything different? You know, that happened to me. I fished the, the practice match on the Friday. And what I did worked absolutely brilliantly. It worked fantastic. You know, and I drew literally just five pegs away. Um, and it was completely the wrong approach for that peg on that day, you know. But why would I change from day one, you know? The only time I would change it, Richard, is if there was anything that I learned during that session. All right. So if you fished, you've had a great day. You know, the thing is, there aren't many, it depends what kind of an angler you are, Richard, but, you know, and what your aspirations are and, and how serious you take your fishing and stuff. But if, it, you know, I've never really had a perfect day, you know, it never happens, you know, because depending on how critical you are about your fishing, even if you catch, say, a hundred pound of silverfish, there will always have been something during that day where you would be thinking, I could have had 105. Or well, you might be thinking, I could have had 120. If you'd done something slightly different, uh, you know, fed differently or gone on a certain line a bit sooner. So, yeah, I mean, in answer to your question, Richard, if it's worked so well, I would keep the basis very much the same. But I dare say that me being me, there would be something that I would change that I think I could have done slightly better. And then that's what you take into your match, if that makes sense. Paul Nixon. Good evening, Paul. Jamie, can I ask your opinion on the angle of tip to feeder? I see many anglers with little anglers. I prefer 45 degrees. Yeah, it's, I mean, I discussed this two days ago with the lad that I was on the bank with um, coaching. It's very much a, um, very much a modern thing to almost, some lads almost point their tip to the feeder. I'm not a fan of it. I never have been, you know, and I've seen people almost lose their rods because of it. I'm a, you know, I was brought up old school. But, you know, I don't only do things because of the way that I've brought up. I do things because I just think it's a better way of doing it. And for me, I love to have a nice angle in the tip if you can get it. All right. And that's for two or three reasons. Well, probably four reasons. All right. Now, the first reason is bite detection. If you've got that angle in your tip, you're going to see the bite much better. You're going to read it better. You're going to see the bite develop to its potential. If you've got that sort of an angle, well, your tip. It can only do that, and then it's almost at its maximum. Whereas if you've got that angle, your tip can go right round to the feeder. It's going to enhance your bites, or you can read your bite much better. The other reason I do it is because when you pick up on a fish, if you've got your rod 
to your line angle like that, well, when you pick up on a fish, you're almost pointing to the feeder. So if I pick up at that angle, you're picking up and your rod's going to bend and you're almost going straight to your feeder and your arm's only got there. Now, for me, the only time that would be an advantage is if you were trying to pull a fish away from a feature. If you were trying to stop it going into some lilies or overhanging trees or roots or something, then you can't afford to let fish run in that scenario. So that is why I'd want to stop them. And that could be a great way of doing it, you know, by just tightening up that bend because you're only going to pick up to there. Your rod's going to be going to the fish and then you're locked onto the fish. But in every other scenario, I'd want to use the bend of the rod to its maximum. That is what the rod's designed for. When you pick up, if you pick up at that angle, your rod is going to bend round to the fish. And as that fish is nodding, the rod is going to be working properly. You know, it's going to be absorbing the nods of the fish. It's going to mean less hook pulls because the rod's doing its job. Obviously, you've got the stretch of the line or the shot leader, you know, but the rod is doing its job properly. And that also gives you a few seconds to gauge the size of the fish. You know, if you're picking up at that angle and already you're straight on the fish, it's difficult to get an idea of, you know, how big or powerful that fish is. When you're striking across your body because of the angle that you've got, your rod is bending round to the feeder, to the fish, and your rod's going to be absorbing, you know, those lunges and those nods, all right? And the other reason why I love to, I like prefer to do it is because if you're fishing to a line clip, if your rod's virtually pointing to the feeder and you're not so tidy at having a turn or two on your reel, well, when you pick up in that position, the fish is going to go, you have literally got one or two seconds to try and get that line clip off. However, when you're striking across your body because of, you've got that angle, your rod is going to bend round, all right, so you can strike into that fish. The rod's going to bend round. It gives you a second or two to gauge the size of the fish. If the fish starts moving, if your arms are in that position, well, you've got all that movement, all that movement, all that movement, all that movement, and then you've got time to take your line clip off. So you're giving yourself about four seconds, depending on how good you are at it, four seconds to get your line clip off if you're going to take your line clip off. It just, it just, it's so much, I think it's so much better. I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, I think it's very much a modern thing that people almost point the tips to it. But for me, that's what I prefer and why. But I hope that answers that. Um, Ryan Forrest, how many rods do you have, Jamie? Um, I don't know because I don't like to hoard rods. The problem, Ryan, is that when you're involved in the scene that I'm involved in, you've got to keep some rods behind, all right? And by that, I basically mean that when we went to Bulgaria, for example, for the for the World Club final, I literally had at least three rods of each set up. And that's because we needed them. You know, we needed a, a, with the main fishing rod. We had another one with a different oak length on it. We had another one which was a, a spare, just in case you had a, a problem with any of those two. And on some occasions, I had a fourth. Now. You know, when we're fishing matches back home, we don't do things to that kind of extent, do we? We don't have three duplicates, so we just don't do it, you know. But because I'm involved in that scene, you need to have those rods for that particular scenario. So I literally have got a few rods that I keep in storage for events that I might only fish once a year, all right? But if I wasn't fishing those events, I wouldn't have too many rods, you know. I mean, I've fished for years. When I was with Matrix, with three rods, not not just three, but three different styles of rods, all right? I had one for my short-range fishing, I had one for my mid-range fishing, and then I had one for long-range fishing. That was it. I had a couple of each, but they covered all the fishing. And if you pick your rods properly, or pick them carefully, should I say, then those rods I could use on still waters, I could use them on canals, and I could use them on rivers, you know, just by thinking about what rod you were using. So I don't know how many rods I've got. I'll be absolutely honest with you, Ryan, but that's because a lot of the rods that I, I don't like to hoard them, uh, you know, I, I give them back to Matrix or I give them to the other Matrix sponsored anglers who, who want on, you know, um, on, on um, free tattle deals and that sort of thing. I don't like to hoard tattle in any way because I hate the fact that I've got good tattle because I look after my tattle. It's all in good condition. I hate to think it's just sat there gathering dust when there's so many anglers out there that can be using it. So I don't really know, Ryan, but it's not a daft number, mate. So I haven't got room. I don't have much room to store tattle anyway. Um, always rains in Loxley. Yeah, you're right. It does. It always rains in Loxley. Andy Phelps, 
Um, which Van der Nijn additive did he mean? Um, he didn't. It was one I mentioned, Andy. He was talking about spices, about adding spices, or it was his father that had, added spices to ground baits for fishing in Ireland. That, that's how the subject got a rose, mate. Um, right, what else we got here? Uh, Stuart Corp. Good evening, Stuart. Any tips on maggot feeder and bomb and bread? Going use them tomorrow on my first winter league match as the water is clear. Yeah, I mean, bomb and bread, basically, it's all about location. You know, I mean, you haven't said popped up. A lot of people think they're popping bread up, but they're not. You know, because we know that the size of hooks that they're using are way too heavy for that bread to be popped up. So bomb and bread's about location. More often than not, that's what it is. It's about chucking around the swim, looking for fish. As it gets colder, fish ball up, as you probably know. And it's about casting a bomb around the swim with bread on, with no feed or anything like that, just trying to pick off single fish. So bomb and bread is usually all about location. Maggot feeder. If you're going to fish a maggot feeder, depending on the venue, just be prepared to hook anything. You know, it's a fantastic way of fishing and it will catch you anything, you know, but just don't go too light on your tackle because you can quite easily hook bonus fish on it this time of year. Uh, and obviously you want to land those fish, don't you? But good luck tomorrow, mate. Right. I'll just go through these last few messages. I didn't realize I've been on as long as what I have. So thank you, everybody, for keeping me entertained. Uh, Terry Stockley. Uh, hi, Jamie. Greetings from Ireland. How did you get on in Feeder King? Never got your result. And did you film it? No, Terry. The reason why I didn't film the reason why I didn't film the Feeder King final is basically because it fished absolutely horrendous. And by horrendous, in fact, it's not even there needs to be another word for it because I think horrendous doesn't do it justice. It was terrible. Out of the 30 anglers that fished in that ten thousand pound final. There were four fish caught out of 30. The other, you know, 26 anglers, I think it was 30 in the angler, 32. There was four fish caught. Four individuals caught one fish apiece. It was absolutely terrible. It wasn't terrible for the four people that caught, but it was Neil Mallinson who won it. He caught one bream, two pounds. It was about two pounds something. And that's all it took to win 10,000 pounds. The reason why I didn't do a big song and dance about it um, Terry is because I didn't want to give the event any bad publicity, you know, that I don't want people, um, just having bad feelings. Yeah. The venue was fish terrible, you know, so we know what Southfield is like, you know, and it went really cold just before then it, it was terrible, but that's why Terry. So no, I, along with the other 24 anglers or whatever it was, um, uh, never had a bite, you know, I drew next to uh, Adam Wakelin. We never had a bite all the way through there. There were four, one, single fish caught which is such a shame for such a big event so that's why i didn't do anything and no i didn't even attempt to film it but obviously i couldn't have <laughs> done anything anyway even if i had filmed it um matrix super match is my favorite hook for match fishing still have enough for a couple of seasons seasons that's good to hear it would be great to get them back in the matrix range yes i know i'm the same and i know so many other anglers that would love to see that pattern of hook back and i even know anglers that are sponsored and part of other tackle companies that used those hooks in fact it was one of their anglers that introduced that hook pattern to me in um, serbia when we fished in serbia in the european feeder challenge so, uh, yes, a lot of people miss that pattern. Uh, Christoph, hi, mate. As you and I know, I am passionate carp angler on commercials, but it's nice to see and hear all your silver adventures. Thank you, Christoph. Yeah, there are loads coming through winter, mate, loads. So thank you, mate. Leslie, Jamie, what are your thoughts on the £100,000 competition run this year i know it tends to be more for commercial angling but would you be interested um there's i've never really got involved in the big money competitions as you probably know leslie things like fisher mania may may have matched this golden reel i've never fished those competitions they're all big money competitions part of the reason for that is because most of the venues are pole fishing orientated um, a lot of them, because of the venues that they are on, it's very much pole fishing orientated. So I have never been in a position to devote myself to pole fishing correctly on matches that, you know, that would cost me over £100 to enter each match. Um, it would cost me probably £120 to fish those matches just to attend them. Um, and I haven't been able to commit to my pole fishing enough to go and try and take those lads on at that game. Um, so that's part of the reason. The other reason is um, 
sometimes when you get involved in those competitions, you could literally spend all season or all year chasing, trying to get in one of those big money finals. And if you don't make it, you can almost just literally go all year or all season um, just not winning anything because you've you've been chasing and going on to these finals where, to be honest, most of them are you've got to win the whole match in order to qualify. And to be honest, with all due respect, and a lot of the venues that are being selected for those qualifiers, sometimes there are literally only three or four pegs in the whole match where you can actually win from. And I just, I've never fancied those odds, not when the matches are costing you £120 to get in. So that's part of the reason why I've never been involved in that. But who knows? You know, I have looked at one or two big competitions for next year, so that might change. The hundred grand, the £100,000 competition, I didn't get involved in it at first because I'll be absolutely honest with you. I wasn't quite sure how it was going to be run. I didn't think the format um, was going to carry any sort of prestige because you're only kind of fishing against one angler to, at a time. And I, like a lot of other anglers, were, weren't were sure how it was going to be uh, organised and ran, you know, because it was such a large sum of money which had come out of nowhere. I think a lot of people have sat back this year and just kind of seen how it pans out. Was it actually going to be a success? Um, would the angler actually walk away with £100,000? You know, because that was an issue, um, you know, because not everybody knew what to expect because it was so new. So, interesting format. Um, it looks like it's been a success this year. I've heard one or two uh, positive things. I've heard one or two negative things, but you'd hear that about every single competition. So, yeah, I mean, for next year, I don't know what the future lies for next year. I am looking at one or two bigger competitions, changing tact a little bit, but there's a long time to go between now and then. I've got a very busy winter ahead, and who knows what opportunities and things are going to come uh, and what's going to happen through winter. But yeah, Leslie, it, it, it's not something that I'd rule out, but it's just not my style of competition at the moment. That's all it is. But who knows for next year? Uh, Mark Lee, are you going to the big one tattle show? Um, I will probably be asked to attend the one at Stoneley. Basically, we split it. So the big one that takes place down in Farnborough every year. I don't really do that one anymore. That will most likely be Mark Pollard and some others. I will probably get asked to do the one at Stoneley, which is in the Midlands, just purely because of the travelling. Obviously, older shot for me is 210 miles away. Whereas um, the Stone Lee show for me is about 80 or 90 miles. So, yeah, it'll, it'll be the Stone Lee one that I'll probably be at on the Matrix stand that I would imagine. Uh, Nick, your World Feeder Championship coverage was excellent. It would be fantastic if you could cover the World Float Championship. It's a real shame, a lack of media coverage. Uh, Nick, I'll be absolutely honest with you and to all the other couple of hundred people who are watching at the moment. If somebody would make it, um, viable and worth my while to cover any of the events, whether it be world championships abroad, at home, or any of the big finals, I would gladly do it as long as it's worth me doing. Simple as that. But obviously for me to travel over to the float championships, which is always going to be in Europe somewhere, it's obviously it's an expensive trip. It's time away from doing other stuff. And the money that that YouTube video would generate wouldn't cover the cost of that trip. Simple as that. But if somebody was ever to set, you know, um, want to uh, to fund or pay to have that coverage done, then I'd, I'd gladly do it. I'd love to do it. So that's the only reason why I wouldn't do it, you know, um, just because it just wouldn't be feasible. That's the only reason. But thank you for that. I did enjoy doing it. I really did. Um, I'm trying to make sure I'm not missing anyone's chat on here, but there are so many at the moment. Nice to see one or two chatting amongst yourself. James Butler, mate, thoughts, barbed or barbless? <laughs> um, I was going to say I'm old school. I've got to say, stop saying that. But basically, we fish matches. When I hook a fish, I want to land it. If barbed hooks are allowed, I will use barbed hooks. If barbed hooks aren't allowed, then I'll only use barbless. Simple as that. You know, barbless hooks, you lose so many fish on them, particularly for certain styles of fishing. If you're speed fishing or trying to catch small fish, Barbless hooks can be a nightmare sometimes, but so barbed if they are allowed. Roger Hayton, I was doing bomb and bread. Bomb and bread, a great method. Uh, Nick Mitchell, on the submerged series, we saw heavier feeders causing more stretch in the mono. Do you have any tips in adjusting the clip for different 
weight feeders to hit the same spot? Um, no, I mean, there are so many variables in that, Nick, and there are so many variables in casting. I mean, I'll, I'll be absolutely honest with you. If you're referring to the, the recent video, the one that um, that only went live this week with myself um, about feeding feeders and that sort of thing, um, there are so many va variables in the casting, you know, and there were one or two things that we did on that video that I had done for a long time. You know, I haven't fished. A prime example of this is that the range that I was actually fishing with the feeding feeder with the 10 foot rod uh, wasn't right for me okay so if that been a match and i had to feed at that range in volume of bait i would have used slightly different kit i would have had my a 12 foot rod i know i would have used a slightly different style of feeding feeder all right so there are variables built into that you know whilst we wanted to keep it as uh, realistic as possible which it was um, obviously, you can't cover every scenario, well, as the video would have been five hours long because we would have tried every selection of feeder, every style of feeder, every type of shot leader, every type of rod. You can't do everything, all right? Um, so, no, in answer to that, I mean, you put, do you have any tips in adjusting the clip for different weight feeders? No. I mean, what, what we tend to do is hit the clip in a different place. All right. And that, that's something that, you know, once you understand it, which I'm sure you do, uh, that everybody understands it, is that, you know, once you understand it, it's something that you can only do in practice. So, for example, you know, sometimes when, when you hit your clip, you haven't only got to hit your clip in one spot. You know, you could hit your clip there. You could hit your clip with your rod here. So by doing things like that, you can adjust where the feed is actually landing. All right. Just there, there are lots of little applic I mean, it's application. It's it's not the way that you, it's not what you're doing. It's the way that you're doing it. It's like when you're fishing deep water, you could hit your clip here, and by moving the rod forward as the feeder's falling, you're letting the feeder fall vertically. It's a completely different way of presenting your feeder from when you just hit your clip normally and put your rod on the rest. It's application. So we would just generally hit the clip in a different place if that makes sense. Um. Great to see you chatting amongst yourselves. That's brilliant. Richard Webb, Jamie, a lot of top anglers say always use the middle tip as that's what tip the rod's designed for and prop your veggies up in the garden with the rest. Do you agree? Uh, no, I don't agree. <laughs> no. Um, I just, this is something that, you know, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I do not ever get bogged down with the rod action all right i am nowhere nearly involved as heavily with product development as what a lot of the top anglers are you know there are some anglers that are out there literally every week with brand new rods new blanks new prototypes trying them out seeing what the test curves like i completely get that and they're emerged in that and they've done that for years and years and years and they will always have a better understanding of rod actions than i will you know, and I'm quite happy for it to stay like that. I would much rather be out on the bank filming or fishing a match or trying something else out than trying 15 different rods out with different playing actions, trying to decide which one's best for me. All right. The only thing I can say to you about rod actions is that I'm not that finicky about it. I'm really not. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's a little bit like the ground bait scenario. You know, the vast majority of people out there work Monday to Friday. They might get one day a week off. And that's the day when they want to go fishing, you know. But you see people getting bogged down with 30 different ground bait mixers, 12 different patterns of hook, and they're trying to find what is the best, you know. And realistically, they're only spending about 50 days of the year actually out there fishing. And you're just never going to do it, you know, and, and and I'm almost in that boat. I mean, I obviously spend more time than that on the bank. But as regards rod actions, I would much rather have the tip right. And when I hook a fish, I've never had, there's only been one rod ever in my entire life that I've used for fishing with that I've thought, I don't like this, you know. And that was a strange one, but it was an important lesson that I learned. And basically what it was, was... I'll tell you, in fact, I'll tell you exactly what it was. The 3.3 meter, the original slim or the excess slim, 3.3 meter was a fantastic rod, brilliant rod, and I would still be using it now. I am using the, the new version now, but I'd still be using the original version, okay? 
But what I actually did was, because it's a 3.3 meter rod and because it's quite soft, what I found is was that when I was fishing at mid range, in certain conditions, it just didn't quite have enough backbone. And I was fishing 35 meters, that sort of range, 40 meters. But when the wind was strong, it just didn't quite have enough backbone to get there. And it really annoyed me because I really wanted to use that rod. And half of the time, the conditions were fine and I could use it. But the other half of the time, the wind was too strong and all that sort of stuff. And I couldn't quite use it. I really, really struggled with it. So I had this magical brainwave that I thought, well, if I start using the 3.5 meter version of that rod, that's going to give the rod a little bit of extra length and that's going to allow me to get to that range. I thought that's going to be brilliant. That then means that I've still got a rod with that nice action. It's still not too long. It's 3.5 meters and it's going to be ideal for that scenario. And I literally cast in twice with that rod and I never picked it up again. And what I learned from that was, is that, you know, the certain actions or the action with a certain rod is the action of that rod. If you suddenly add 20 centimetres onto that rod with the same action, it's going to be a completely different action. And, and I hated it. I really didn't like it. I only cast in twice with it, and it wasn't what I expected. So that is the only time in my entire life when I've actually put a rod down through its action. So I would always rather have the tip that's right. You know, um, I never really these days ever go below, below a, a one-ounce tip, and that's because, you know, I just I, I don't see the need for going any any lighter than that. And more often than not, the venues that I'm fishing, there's always some sort of toe on the venue, and, and a tip any lighter than that is going to be bent round because of the toe. So I might have ram, rambled on about that one again, but no, I disagree with that, Richard. You know, I prefer the tip to be right for the job for the day. But I don't get bogged down in rod action. I, d I don't. You know, if a rod's a little bit too beefy or a little bit too stiff, then I might not use it for that job, but I'll just use it for bigger fish, you know, and put it down for to do another job. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I can't get bogged down with all that sort of stuff. I just don't have enough time. Uh, but anyway, there we go. Uh, Carl Redmond, good evening, mate. Thanks for logging on, everybody. There's so many on here now, isn't there? Well, we're just coming up to the two-hour mark, so thanks for uh, all the questions, everybody. I'm going to go through these last couple of questions. Um, Dita, good evening. Start fishing since Corona, so that's a good thing. And that I guess learned a lot from you. Hope to meet you in the Netherlands someday. Yes, that would be great. I'd love to get back to Holland soon. I haven't been for a while. James Butler, cheers for your time tonight, buddy. Very interesting as always. No problem, James. Thanks for logging on, mate. Tony Matthews, Ian and Germany, been watching your recent videos. That damn flask was a nightmare, a snag pit. I felt for you, mate. What did Drennan Barnsley have up their sleeve on that feeder club champs? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the reservoir is not a nightmare. It was just where I chose to fish. I didn't realise. I've never fished there before. Um, and the ironic thing was, um, as soon as the bailiff turned up, he says, what are you doing fishing here, Jamie? It's a right snag pit. But I'd already set up, put some feed in. Um, so I had to fish it out. But yeah, that was the only spot that's as bad as that. The rest of the reservoir is OK. Um, Drennan Barnsley Blacks, World Feeder Club Champs. Um, it was an interesting week for so many reasons, you know, and, you know, I can't say too much about their approach because I don't know everything about their approach. I didn't sit near them. We actually trained next to them on Wednesday. We drew the next training box to them on, on the Wednesday of training week and they didn't catch very much at all. We caught more than them. Um, and they openly admit their captain, um, Glenn Lawrence, actually told me, he says that was, he didn't say it was a wake up call, but he said he knew that they had to change a few things or just find find more fish and things. But I mean, one of the key tactics for them was they, they were actually staying in a hotel um, right on the banks of the rowing course. And they walked down the banks um, on several of the evenings and they saw lots of chub close in on an evening, really close in. And so they developed uh, or found a way of catching a few chub. Not many, and they only caught them really, really late on. And they certainly got some of the lads out of jail and got them some extra points. But that was a key tactic that we didn't pick up on. We never even tried it, I'll be absolutely honest with you. So that was a fantastic tactic that they picked up on, targeting chub really late on. But because some of the section, well, most of the section was really hard, because they're so hard, they only needed a couple of chub this sort of size that would just rocket them right up that section. And that approach worked for, I think it worked for at least two or might have been three of the anglers um, on one of the days. And it certainly worked. It worked well for Will Freeman on day two. Uh, I think he caught 
I don't know if he caught two or three on it. So he'd obviously set that line up perfectly for the last 20 minutes to catch three chub. Um, and it, and it, it, one or two other angles caught on that as well. So as regards to the rest of their tactics, I'm not that sure because, like I said, I never got a chance to, to see them about it other than the chub approach. Uh, but, yeah, that was definitely one that they picked up on. They did brilliant to work it out. Uh, Richard Webb, Jamie, how much did or will that submerged video you did change the way you bait it? Um it has changed one or two things already. Um, it confirmed more things. Like I said earlier, Richard, it just confirmed one or two things that we thought. Um, and so, you know, we have to just change the way that we feed, you know. A lot of what you do, what we're doing in fishing is you're trying to think trying to think about what you achieve. A lot of people see some some people do stuff, whether it be on YouTube or whatever it might be, and they see see them do something and they don't really think about why it's been done in that way. And so they just copy them. So it's all right saying, yeah, I'm going to put 10 feeder falls in out there. That's it. Well, that's all well and good. You know, somebody might go out there and put 10 feeder falls like that out there. That's great. But as you probably learned from that video and what a lot of you will already know is that there are probably about five different ways of putting 10 feeder falls out there. There's five different ways. You could try and put them all in one spot, really nice and neat, tidy. You could spread the bait out. You could put two slightly further out, two in the middle, two a bit closer, two a bit closer. You know, you could pack the ground bait in really tightly so that you just ease the ground bait out with minimum disturbance. You could overwet that ground bait. You could have it really dry so it explodes from the feeder. You could empty that feeder halfway down before it even hits the bottom to get loads of cloud in the water and trying to track fish in. You could empty that feeder as soon as it hits the bottom so that you're actually running the risk of bringing ground bait towards you. You could fill that ground bait so it empties as soon as it hits the bottom. You could cast the feeder out there so it hits the bottom and you leave it there for two minutes so that the ground bait melts out of the feeder and then you just ease the ground bait out without any disturbance. So already there, I've just named about eight different ways of doing it. So it's all down to application again, Richard. All right, so there were things in that video, looking at the mix that we used, the depth of water we were in, and all that sort of thing, the style of feeder. I've already said that the style of feeder I wouldn't have used at that range in my own match fishing. All right, so the style of feeder I would have used would have been different. So it's application again. All right, so um, I feel as though I'm overcomplicating things, Richard, but it's just, you know, once you've got the kit, once you've got the tattle, you know, any most people can go out and buy all these bits of tattle. They can buy the rods, they can buy the, the, the reels and everything else. But it's the way that you apply it, you know, and that's where the top anglers get the edge, you know, and that's where they're constantly looking for edges as well. So, but there we go. Well, we've just gone over the two hour mark and I don't want to take all your evenings up. Um, I've just spotted one here. Tony Matthews, is international fishing something you will go more into given the opportunity? Um, Tony, from 2010, the only thing I've ever wanted to do is fish for England in a world feeder championship. Simple as that. And that's not gone away yet. You know, that's not gone away. That's been out of my hands. All I could ever do in those 10 years since then is get as good as those lads. That's the only thing I, would, I could ever do. Tom Pickering said to me at that first ever England feeder team trial, I had a meeting with him just after that. And full credit to Tommy. He says, if you want to get involved with this setup, which I have stayed, stayed involved in since then, he says, I can't guarantee that you will ever fish for England, he says, but I'll guarantee it will make you a better angler. And you can't, you know, you can't say fair in that, you know, massive credit to Tommy for saying that, you know, and, and that's that's what's happened. So all I've ever wanted to do is get to that world standard uh, or be good enough to fish a world championship. And then if I get picked, then that's an added bonus, but that's out of my hand. We don't have a trialing system in England. You know, we don't have um a selection system where you fish trial uh, where you fish leagues or or anything like that we don't have that in this country so that bit's out of my hands but you know i've loved the journey so far but yes i would love to fish more international venues uh, more international competitions that's where i get a, the buzz at the moment in my fishing um so there we go anyway uh richard knight jamie what's your view on mixing your ground bait on the night before a match um i do do it sometimes richard if i'm using a mix that i need to be really inert i basically mix it but i always bag it up in an airtight bag get squeeze the air out and put it in the fridge overnight just to make sure it's as fresh as it can be for the following day simple as that mate but yeah i do do it sometimes but to be quite honest richard but you know a lot of the matches that we're going now we get so much time before the start of a match or we get enough time and a lot of the matches I fish, I'm only mixing a pint and a half, two pints. 
that there's plenty of time before the match. So, I, you know, more often than not, I like to do it when I get on the bank with the lake water so it's nice and fresh. Um, Tony Matthews, I know Steve Ringer has gone more into it, as he said on that fish-off against Bennett. <clears throat> Yeah, Steve's devoted to the international scene for the last eight years or so. That's why he's not fished any Fishermanias. He's not fished. He's not been to Y Takers. He's not fished Maver Match Thisers. He just doesn't do it because of that, you know. And whether he'll stay involved in that, I'm, I mean, I'm sure he will. I'm sure he will. So yeah, it's um, we would have definitely done more fishing abroad if there'd been more opportunities to fish abroad. Um, Stuart Bridges, first time on here. Off to watch Jimmy Hughes tomorrow at Burton Farm for the Flyer TV Winter Classic qualifier. All right, nice one. I'm sure you'll learn something from that, mate. Um, right, okay. I'm going to sign off now. I mean, I mean, it's been two hours and five minutes. I just want to say thank you to everybody who's logged on tonight. This was a, an unannounced live stream, um, and it's just something that you know I'd like to do more often. Uh, there's definitely going to be one every month on here anyway on YouTube, but obviously there are more live streams on the membership channel on Match Fishing TV, which I mean, lots of people still ask about. Um, but it's just because on there it's a much smaller group, it's easier to answer everyone's questions, um, and there are more of them each month. So, um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for logging on to again tonight. The next YouTube video is on uh, Monday. Um, I filmed it today. I will be putting that together tomorrow. It will be on this channel on Monday at 7 p.m. Um, and I think you'll enjoy it. It touches on some of the topics that we spoke about tonight, but a bit more in depth for you. Um, so that's 7 o'clock on YouTube on, on Monday. So And then there will be lots more uploads coming through November. So like I say, if you're not a subscriber already, please click subscribe and give this a, a thumbs up because that's the best way I get to know about what you want to see, you know, what kind of content you want to see and what kind of videos you want to want to watch. And if that's the case, then uh, I can keep producing them for you. So um, thanks to everybody for logging on tonight. Like I say, if you watch this on playback, you should be able to see all the chat and everything. Um, and if you want to get more involved in these sorts of chats, then uh, the main channel forum is the Match Fishing channel, which I've just put a, a link there. That's where the, the more in-depth videos are and stuff. So thanks a lot, everyone. My coffee is just about gone cold now, so I'm going to have that. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, everybody. I really appreciate all the support. Like I said, we've got 400 videos on here now. And um, thanks to the feedback from, from everyone here, I'm looking forward to producing the next 400 for you with some very exciting twists, turns and experiences along the way. So enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for getting involved. We appreciate it. And I'll see you on Monday night at 7 p.m. for the next upload. So take care, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And I'll see you Monday. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>